Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Ace Couple Podcast. My name is Courtney. I'm here with my spouse, Royce, and we have a guest today, one that you will recognize. In fact, you know him, you love him. We have the fabulous Tiger Songbird. Tiger, welcome back. Glad to be back. I'm glad you guys invited me back. I'm so happy. So how have you guys been? Oh, you know, (laughs) Pride Month is creeping up on us. There is a lot of work to do. We have been just busy as can be, but we have been trying to get more interviews back on the podcast. And it's been a minute since we've talked to you. So we definitely thought, well, we've got to get Tiger back on if we're doing a new wave of interviews. I know. I love joining you guys' podcast. I've recommended you guys to everybody that I know so that everyone could know about your podcast. And I saw you guys uh, the past year get into some national recognition, some international recognition as well. So I suppose you could say that. (laughs) Couldn't be more well-deserved. You know, I was watching. Oh, that's so appreciated. I really should be due for a trip to Kansas City the way I can meet you guys in person. <laughs> you should. We, we've we said it before. You are welcome here. You're not all that far away. I mean, I, I don't know if it goes as far south as uh, Oklahoma, but I definitely know there's like this middle of the country mindset that like if I can drive there in the span of a day, it is driving distance. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we drive into Kansas City in six hours, so. Oh, six hours. That's nothing. We're practically neighbors. <laughs> Although I didn't do it to the Kansas side, I went to the Missouri side, but now I'm going would be Kansas, which I don't know if that's the good side or the bad side. I think that's the better one right now, right? It is the better one right now. I mean, they, they've they both got some political issues going on right now, but somehow Kansas is the better one. All right. Yeah, I'll be there. I lived in Kansas for two years. It was uh, it was interesting right outside of Wichita. So it's very beautiful. I do love the Kansas, you know, landscape and, and everything. So I do appreciate it a lot. So those two years were really cool to watch and, and look at it. So I'm doing it for another trip back. We have realized talking to people all over the world that that is a pretty uniquely American thing because some people's countries are a six hour drive across. <laughs> Yes, I know. It's I know. It's like you go to there's a bridge in between Portugal and Spain that actually like takes ten minutes. It's like it's like ten minutes, and you're from Portugal right into Spain. I'm like that is an easy convenience. That's like less time that it takes to me get to the grocery store. Yeah, well, we have so much just land right here that so many of the cities in the middle of the country especially are so spaced far apart and most people will be like well if you're driving eight hours anyway why don't you just take a plane it's like because none of our airports are major hubs so it's really expensive to fly between them i know i know that's that's so vast it's so expensive So you heard it here first, audience. The next time we have Tiger on the podcast, we will be recording in person. We'll have maybe maybe we'll be able to have a little like ace get together in Kansas City while you're here. I think that would be so cool. Yeah. You know, we do need an ace conference in America, like a super conference. (laughs) <laughs> a super conference. Well, maybe maybe we'll start small. We're we're still very very uh reluctant to be in large groups of people right now because of, you know, pandemic things, but I don't know if it's something in the summer, if there's an outdoor component, if there's also an online component. I think there's a lot of potential there. Oh yeah, that would be great. I vote for right around this time because it's like 80 degrees right now in my town. Oh yeah. This is when it's really good before the weather starts turning to 110. Yes. And then you just end up being so hot, you just might as well not even cook. You might as well just take your eggs, make an omelet, break it and cook it on the sidewalk because it'll take like two minutes to cook. Agree. It definitely needs to be spring because it, it there's a tiny window. It, it goes from, well, may, maybe in Oklahoma, it doesn't get it quite as cold as it gets here because you're a little, you're a little souther than we are, but. <laughs> Depends on what you mean by cold. <laughs> it gets too cold and then it gets too hot. And there's a teeny tiny window in spring and a teeny tiny window in fall where it's just perfect. <laughs> 
There's a reason why Oklahoma is number one for meteorologists in the world. Mm. It, you get every bit of weather you could possibly get. We have the winter. People get shell shocked. They get shell shocked as to how the winter in Oklahoma is like. It's down south. Why is there black ice and we're sliding all over the place in this thing? Like oh, I don't even understand it. Like people, don't, people for one, it's hard to drive and there's so many wrecks on the road. That's why when it's a snow day. <laughs> and it starts snowing, we should start shutting things down because we know not only is it snowing, it's going to be some black ice coming up the next morning and it's just going to slip and slide all over people's cars sliding. I literally had to help a friend once because his car almost hydroplaned out. Oh, so, see, I, I believe that because I think all of all of these states that are just stacked right on top of each other <laughs> in, in the middle of the country, they, they all have such extreme weather. And one thing I've noticed since I grew up in South Dakota, after moving to Kansas City, it's like the weather is exactly the same, but milder all around. It doesn't get quite as cold, but all of it is still present. <laughs> we are Tornado Alley after all. We just came from having a tornado hit one of our towns that literally took out almost every house in the town. So, oh, yeah, it sounds like Joplin, Missouri, a few years ago. Everyone talks about that around here as like the big disaster. We just keep having them. The, the difference is when when I was in South Dakota, we'd never shut anything down for weather at all because it's like you live in South Dakota. Buck up. This is just how it is. So if there was ice, if there was black ice, there could be an ice storm where literally trees are cracking in half because they are so frozen and falling on cars. And people will be like, you still got to go to work because this is South Dakota. This is what you signed up for. And we wouldn't have school canceled unless it hit like negative 25 degrees Celsius. Celsius, so we'd still be going in zero degree weather. Fahrenheit. Did did I say Celsius? Why did I do that? Yeah, n no one in South Dakota uses Celsius. Nobody, nobody in this country uses Celsius. <laughs> The metric system has been completely thwarted in America. No, negative 25 Fahrenheit. So, yeah, it's, it was not good. I mean, that's why I got like, I literally got frostbite on my fingers just trying to walk from the school to the library across the street in elementary school because nobody should have been out in that weather, but they're like, you live in South Dakota, kid, gotta, gotta handle it. <laughs> see, see, our heat is crazy. Our heat is super crazy. It's nuts. It could be 115 degrees outside and we would be just okay going out. It'd be like, just get out there and just go. <laughs> just go. Ugh, ugh. I don't like the heat. I do not like the heat. So... I, I prefer heat. I prefer heat myself. Do you? Oh, I, I can't handle heat. I, I hate the cold. My bro my bones are brittle, so it's like <laughs> 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 I'm really skinny as is, so I don't have a lot of weight or, you know, insulation on my body. So the cold makes it like I'm getting hit in all different directions and I feel like I'm tipping over sometimes when it's oh, no. incredibly windy. When it's incredibly windy, I fall. <laughs> Timber. <laughs> 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 so, yes, I, I would prefer to live where it is always warm, particularly somewhere in the range of 80 to 90. 150 degrees, I could tolerate it for a little bit. Oof. I mean, I've actually played, I played basketball in 100 degree heat once. So it, plenty of times in my life. So that's just what you get used to. Uh, that's why summertime, that's why everyone goes out and plays basketball in summertime, because it's finally a time you can actually play basketball and not worry about slipping on the flat tops. <laughs> true, true. Yep. Okay. I would die. I cannot, but I, I respect those who can handle the heat. If you can't stand the heat, stay inside, never leave the house. <laughs> <laughs> now that we've done the Midwestern thing and thoroughly discussed the weather and geography and travel and areas that we have all been in. That is, that is hopelessly Midwestern. <laughs> I think they got confused. Are we on the Ace Couple podcast or is this the Weather Channel right now? No, listen, listeners who are not from the Midwest or don't associate with people from the Midwest, this is customary. This, this is mandated. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, you been a couple of years in the Wichita area. That's pretty close to where I grew up. What a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> this is tradition. So now that we have met the appropriate requirements for a, a Midwestern conversation, let's get into the main topic of today, because I'm really, really excited. When we first started this podcast, and we sort of 
ask the community, what sort of things do you want to hear an ace couple talk about on a podcast? The number one answer that we got across the board was talk about ace representation in the media. And so we have done that on a number of occasions. We've talked about the good, the bad, the ugly, the complicated. But today... We have a valuable resource. We have Tiger Songbird, and you are familiar with the show that we have never, ever seen before. So I want you to tell us all about the Big Bang Theory. Oh, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. I can tell this is going to be a good one already. (laughs) This is going to be great. So, yes, the Big Bang Theory. I I actually had to look up the year it came out. I think it came out. It came out in 2008. I think I was, I think I was really entering college when it came out as a show. So it came out in 2007. So right as I was finishing my senior year in high school. So that's, that just lets you know how old and how long the show went. It went for 12 seasons. So I didn't even realize it went that long. Wow. Yes. It was the number one show on primetime television for quite a while. And Jim Parsons, who we're going to talk about with Sheldon. He played Sheldon. Uh, He was the number one TV actor. I think the number one TV actress was from uh, Modern Family, Sofia Vergara. She's a Colombian actress, and she played on Modern Family, which is another show my family loved to watch. And Jim Parsons was number one on all TV. He was just racking up Emmys. He was just collecting them. It was almost like Pokemon Emmys. (laughs) Just give him one a year while he was at it. But yeah, so I was literally just finishing my high school year, and I remember the show Big Bang Theory coming out because it's rather interesting that there hadn't been a show really dedicated to kind of geek culture. Because I grew up personally myself as a hybrid. So I'm kind of like a hybrid mixture. I mean, you always talk about cliques in school and you, you know, we always talk about what clique did you belong to or what group were you most associated with? So I kind of had like a mixture of groups. Like I didn't really fit into like a perfect blend of everything, but I fit into like a lot of different groups at different times. So I was grew up with an athletic family. My family is very athletic. My father played baseball. My brother played basketball. I love basketball and play. And that, you know, we had that in a mixture. And then I was the choir kid in the family. So I grew up in choir groups and I still sing to this day. So that's, you know, choir geek me and then sports geek me. And then I have real geek me where who's into like science and trivia geek me person, you know, who loves to go to trivia nights every week. So I played uh, academic bowl, trivia bowl in school. So there wasn't like a show dedicated to just geek culture and science geeky and, and everything like that, which I was like, wow, this is a really interesting show. When I saw it come on, I watched the first episode and it was rather interesting. The pilot episode was because I remember Johnny Galecki, he was he was on Roseanne and he was a little boy on Roseanne. That is a show that I watched. I did see Roseanne. <laughs> yeah. So I remembered him. I didn't really know much about the show. And it was kind of this show where it was four guys who liked to hang out and were science geeks and all worked at the same university, Caltech, basically. And he got a new roommate who was this young blonde girl that just moved in from Nebraska. (laughs) And she was trying to make it as an actress. So I remember the show when they kind of showed the first series. It's like, okay, this is young girl. And obviously, you know, geeks and girls, they always play on like the revenge of the nerds type thing where they're like the geeks are always trying to get the the girl that conventionally attractive girl because it's like you know i guess all geeks dream about but i was rather interested because i loved the character of sheldon in the beginning and i really loved sheldon because he was particularly not interested and you could kind of tell and i guess the thing with sheldon he is exceptionally brilliant he graduated college at a i think 13 and he was graduated with like his first bachelor at 13 he's got a doctorate and he's you know an adult now and he's trying to figure out string theory to make string theory come complete and as a physicist and i was like he's really interested in science and i was really rather interested in him because he wasn't really interested in what the other guys were which was all about trying to get trying to get girls and trying to get get sex and everything like that and it was like wow sheldon kind of fit with me because it was always like that you know i, I hung around, around a bunch of guys and and school that were all about trying to get girlfriends and the whole American pie thing where it was going on in high school. Cause that was big when I was in school, the American pie world, which was like, everybody's trying to get snacks before they graduate. And, you know, you don't want to graduate before you haven't officially, you know, lost your, your V card and all that. And it's like, uh, 
playing on the whole teenagers are, you know, wild and crazy teenagers and stuff like that. And it's like, I was not that. I was not the wild, crazy teenager. I was the, I've never really been wild and crazy uh, in my life like that. So let's fill in a quick gap in uh, Courtney's pop culture lexicon, (laughs) because you, you mentioned American Pie, which is also something I have not seen, but I think I'm still familiar with it. Is that the one that the band camp joke comes from? One time okay. when I was at band camp, one time Thank when I was you. at band okay. camp, one time <laughs> when I was at band camp. Yeah, that one. And that's kind of the whole deal. And, you know, there have always been teen movies where they've always done stuff like teenagers do wild things and try to get girls. You know, Weird Science was another one in the 80s with the John Hughes films or The Breakfast Club in the 80s with, you know, Molly Ringwald and uh, Emilio Estevez. That one I did see. Uh, you know, Charlie Sheen's brother. You know, they always do these shows where they're like, you know, the geeky guys are always trying to get with the girls that are typically quote unquote out of their league or some of like the popular girls in school and stuff like that. And then super bad was something like that as well with uh, Jonah Hill and Michael Sarah. That was another one where they were trying to get a bunch of people like that. The Judd Apatow universe was really like that quite a lot. So having a show where a character who wasn't really interested in that, the way they framed Sheldon was always in a way problematic for me because Sheldon was always framed in a way as a comic relief, even though he's the brilliant genius, like more elevated genius of his friends than the other three, because, you know, they always framed Sheldon as robotic. They always framed Sheldon. And while Sheldon, you know, they always said, I'm not, he always used to say, I'm not crazy. My mom had me tested. Oh, oh. Oh, no. (laughs) Because I guess they try to test him to see if he was on the autism spectrum, which, again, if you were on autism spectrum, I hate that idea because I worked with students with autism. And quite frankly, the idea that always gets passed around as a myth is that, you know, people who are on the autism spectrum just aren't interested in sex. It's a very ableistic rhetoric because, quite frankly, I've had a lot of students with autism who have been very interested and they want to have girlfriends. They want to, you know, get married. They want to have, you know, families. And it's just it's very ableistic because it's like we're in a state of mind now. I'm sure you guys have seen some of the articles about like birth replacement and oh, yep. <laughs> birth population declining. Well, what they always frame it as is like, well, people with disabilities should get excluded from this. And it's kind of like an attempt at eugenics in a way, because it's like if you're oh yeah someone with a disability, you shouldn't read is what they're basically saying. And that's just really rude to say. And the frame Sheldon in that way as someone like being robotic is basically like, oh, he's not because he's you know he's on the autism spectrum or he's got high functioning Asperger's or I'm like okay first of all that's really horrible framing of what the autism spectrum looks like for one and what Asperger's looks like two and then three this is where we're going to get at today because I know people would like to discuss that further I'm going to try to keep it to this as much as possible three there's nothing wrong with Sheldon not being interested you know in sex like that and there's nothing wrong with that and they framed it in that degree because early on in episodes they would often try to pigeonhole Sheldon into like sexual scenarios where people would try to like be interested in him, but he's not interested. Like in the first episode, Penny, who is played by Kaylee Cuoco, her shower doesn't work. So Leonard and Sheldon, uh, Leonard, basically Sheldon kind of doesn't like people using personal spaces and stuff. So Sheldon and Leonard, they have a shower and it's like, Leonard goes, you can use our shower since yours isn't working. And Penny comes out in a towel. Basically, just basically wearing nothing but a towel on because in the shower and Sheldon kind of diverts his eyes and like, you know, tries to not look at her, you know, being respectful, I guess, of her. And and it's like Leonard, Howard and Raj, who are the three friends, are just like really like, oh, gosh, you know, really super interested. And it's like, you know, they always keep trying to frame it that way. And as the series and the episodes go on, it really gets like even worse to a degree. It gets really worse. There was one episode in season two, if I'm not mistaken, where Sheldon takes on this new, basically, protege. Her name is Ramona, and she would be a kind of a recurring character in this show. And Ramona's really interested in Sheldon, not only for his intellectual brilliance, but also because Sheldon could be on the cusp of a world-renowned discovery. So she basically is like a groupie for Sheldon. And Ramona agrees to, like, do all of Sheldon's, like, chore work in exchange for, like, 
I guess, favor from him. Like the first time they meet, like she agrees to go get him his favorite meal on a day. Like Sheldon is regimented in terms of like, he likes to eat certain meals on certain days. So he goes to eat Thai food and she goes to his favorite Thai restaurant and orders it exactly to the T, exactly gets everything done. And then she meets him and, and Penny is like stunned. It's like, are you? did you come to see Leonard? No, I came to see Dr. Cooper. Dr. Sheldon Cooper? And it's like, yes, we're having dinner. Sheldon. And it's like, and it's kind of framed in that way because they're like looking at it and they're like, okay, Sheldon and Ramona, and they kind of go into like this witty repartee and it goes, I think Ramona says at one point, I read your la- latest report and I got to say it was incredibly stimulating. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> kind of framing it in, you know, they're basically doing like, it was like an innuendo between, it was like my hypotheses tend to have that effect on people. Oh no. <laughs> So, and then Ramona kind of gets it kicked out. And then at that point, like Penny asked the question and goes, okay, it's not my place to ask the questions, but I got to honestly know. And Penny asks, you know, Leonard, Raj and Howard, because Howard is like a huge... I don't like calling people dogs or hounds, but like he is all about it. Like he's, I don't even like calling it hypersexual. It's just like he got a super high appetite, I guess. But Penny asks, okay, I got to ask, what's Sheldon's deal? And then, you know, what's his deal? Is it girls, guys, sock puppets? And Leonard asks, he goes, we've operated under the assumption he has no deal. Mm. And Penny's like, come on, everybody has something. Oh, no. (laughs) Everybody's got something. And it said, Howard goes, not Sheldon, not Sheldon. Honestly, we've asked the years of how he would even possibly reproduce. I think Howard goes into like, I think he's going to be mitosis. I think I'm an advocate of mitosis, which is where like in the ace community, there was a joke for a while where it was like mitosis and asexuality were kind of linked for a while. Yeah. Well, it sounds like something that could actually be like quality ace humor if there were ace people in the writer's room or playing Sheldon. Like if it was done with sensitivity and research, there there's potential there. I could see myself seeing that conversation and being like, yeah, what an what an allo conversation to have about ace people. <laughs> We've mentioned a couple times before that one of the really early, like pre Avon ace communities was Haven for the human amoeba. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of like some of these jokes kind of come in from. So it's like, I believe Sheldon will, you know, eat enough Thai food and then split into two Sheldons. <laughs> and that's kind of how they thought, because they've never seen Sheldon be interested. Literally in one episode in season one, re flashback, Raj is actually set up with the, the day because his parents are trying to set him up on an arranged marriage because Raj is is from India and he's, you know, the whole thing of he's not getting any younger kind of thing, which I've heard quite often. You're not getting any younger. <laughs> you know, I just turned 33 myself. So I often get that. You're not getting any younger. So Raj is set up by his parents to be with this girl from back home who used to pick on him, but now is all grown up. And uh, now Raj, who has an inability to speak to women whatsoever, because he's got such social anxiety. So he's got a social anxiety disorder where he finds himself unable to speak to women. Raj is set up on this date. He ends up getting drunk on the on the date, and he finds himself now being able to speak. He is speaking, stumbling, and everything, and you know, in vino veritas, I guess. You know, in Winder's truth, he's just saying anything that's on his mind, including things that are like, "You got to stop now. You got to stop saying some things." So he's on a date. Sheldon comes in and sees the girl, and her name is Lalita, and he sees her and he goes, "Oh my gosh, that's Princess Panchali. She's from an Indian fa- uh, fairy tale that I." I grew up reading Indian princess who falls in, uh, who befriends a monkey and make, makes the monkey her friend. That was kind of interesting. It's a long story to that. But anyway, Lalita and Sheldon start talking. And Lalita, apparently, like, in a way that people kind of were picking up, like, well, Sheldon was, like, speaking and I guess was, you know, sweet talking <laughs> in a way. But he was just kind of being himself, talking about the how she looks like the Princess Panchali. Like, you look just like her. And Raj's date starts falling for Sheldon. And Raj gets jealous. It's like, I'm going to have to unleash my wrath on you if you keep speaking to her that way. And uh, you're trying to take that girl away from me. <laughs> Sheldon's like, I'm not hitting on her. And uh, she's like, I'm not your girl. Turned out Lolita only went on the date because like, because her parents put her up to it as well. She didn't want to do it either. So by the end of the discussion, Lolita and Sheldon end up leaving together and Raj is left there agape, mouth agape, like what happened? And then Howard goes, I don't know what happened, but I just learned how to uh, pick up Indian girls. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. I was like, oh, my gosh. That sounds so racist. 
But what ended up happening at, at the end of the episode is that it turned out Lalita is a dentist. So they kind of had a discussion on dentistry, which Sheldon already kind of was interested in. While Roger's mad, Sheldon kind of reveals at the end, it's like, what happened between you and Lalita? And he goes, we just talked about dentistry, talked about, you know, how dental plaque can lead to myocarditis, which I already knew. So it was really nothing I needed to speak to her about. And it goes, are you going to go see her again? And Sheldon goes, why would I see her again? I already have a dentist. <laughs> so, so, so. So while a lot of people were thinking, oh, Sheldon just got himself a girlfriend, Sheldon's like, I'm not interested in that. And Leonard goes, I wonder who will tell his parents he's not having any grandkids anytime. Oh, man. See, from, from everything you've said so far, I'm hearing so much potential, like really good potential with like problematic elements thrown in, which I guess you said it was like 2007, 2008 was when it started. So that era of TV is not, you know, perfectly pure. But man, it sounds like there was so much that could have been really good for a really promising ace character here. Yeah, the story writing could have just gone a different direction, just a slightly bit of a turn. It would have been so much better. Like the writers of Big Bang Theory could have just normalized Sheldon and be like, okay, he's not interested in that. And it's like, he's complete as a person. He's happy as a person. He's content as a person. But oftentimes they're just playing up with comic relief. Like because Sheldon and Leonard live together as two men, there is often so much like ties of like two men living together as being like they're an odd couple Oscar and Felix scenario. Whereas, you know, our are they gay? Are they not? Like, they live, they're two men living together. So, obviously, they must be, you know, in a couple relationship as, as two gay guys living together. You know, must be, be in a relationship with each other. And it's like two men living together does not mean that they have to be in a relationship. They can live in a flat and that wouldn't be anything. You know, just two roommates. They're two roommates. They have nothing, but, you know, everyone assumes they're gay and in a relationship with each other. And that's obviously playing on the homophobia in the element. Like, oh, you know, two men living together. That's great that's great you know you guys obviously are i'm glad i'm so happy and supportive of you finding love with each other and i'm like they're not in a relationship are you saying that the only reason two people would live together is because they're in love with each other which i don't see that happening as often with like two women that are roommates <laughs> like it's a little more acceptable yeah it, it hardly ever happens in some cases it kind of does in a way but like the sex in the city world for four women being friends is just four women being friends because girlfriends you know i watched girlfriends with kelsey Grammer, and it was four women you know basically living and doing life together almost always under one's roof no one bats an eye at that but two men living together is always seen as some reason as some gay relationship and it's like two men can live together or like the three's company universe where it was like i'll throw this in if a man and a woman live together and they're just roommates then it's always seen as some sort of you know if they're not married then this must be some sort of you know cohabitation the nice polite way they like to say of they must be just shacking up they must just be playing house as i've heard or living in sin <laughs> being illicit. A lot of it's like you can't be friends with someone of the opposite gender and stuff like that. It's like, huh, can we please get past this yet at this time it hadn't? But yes, that ends up being a huge storyline. But Sheldon has no interest in anyone. And that leads to another complication when his friends try to set him up. Because like they've tried to set him up on different occasions. Like uh, Raj actually kind of, I guess, twisted Sheldon's arm one time to make him go with them to this speed dating event. Like Sheldon's like, ah, I don't want to go. So he ends up bribing Sheldon by giving him these the limited edition Green Lantern lantern. <laughs> and he says, okay, if, if I give you this, you have to go with me. And he does. And Raj ends up finding a girl who is also kind of a bit of a geek herself. And Sheldon finds a girl. And I can't remember. It's like in season three, but I can't remember her name. And they end up talking like their form of conversation is talking about the essay Flatland, which is like a sci-fi Victorian era essay. You can actually find it and read the PDF online, which is really interesting. I actually read it. It's kind of interesting. It reads like a short story. We'll put it in the show notes for our listeners. Why not? It's kind of, it kind of reads like a short story, but it's also an essay. So it's really rather interesting. And they kind of discuss it and Sheldon's form, like when they talk about scoring as a wingman, Sheldon calls it scoring and they're playing guitar hero, <laughs> playing rock band. <laughs> And that's their form. And that's their form of like their form of fun. But it's like, okay. But at the end of the episode, she ends up trying to go further. She wants to take it like 
You know, they're all saying, let's take our relationship to the next level. Because it's a game and the prize is sex. You have won when you have achieved sex. <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, I like to, you know, do a little bit more and go to the next level. And Sheldon, he doesn't think that way. He's just not even interested in that. And at the end of the episode, she tries to go into his bedroom. It's like, uh, well, they're kind of going in the next room and I need a place to stay because I can't drive overnight. And she goes, OK. And Sheldon agrees. He lets her come into his bedroom, which was a huge thing because he doesn't like anybody coming into his space in his inner sanctum. So she comes and she sits on the bed and people are going, ooh something about to happen like uh, oh are they about to do it and then sheldon goes i'm gonna go sleep in leonard's room good night <laughs> so so he leaves her in his in his room and he goes sleeps in leonard's room which was kind of the deal of like yeah sheldon's not not trying to do anything and people are like the audience just goes come on sheldon you could have gotten laid by that girl and it's like sheldon's just not interested in it i wish the show wouldn't have made it such comic relief you know, making him seem like, oh, Sheldon's just like, he's not receptive or he doesn't understand social cues or, you know, he doesn't understand like, you know, when people are flirting with him, which I wouldn't understand it either. <laughs> so, yeah, well, that that's something I actually kind of like and would like to see in like replicated, but in a really good sensitive way for future Ace Rep. I would love to see an Ace who's just completely oblivious to, you know, the romantic and core and and sexual tension cues because I, I think that's relatable to a lot of aces. I have 1000% been on like dates that I did not think was a date, but the other person thought we were on a date. And it's like, well, you didn't tell me this was a date. You did not ask me on a date. So I'm I'm not playing this game where, you know, I'm a woman and you're a man. So if we're hanging out, it must be romantic. Like, I'm not playing that game. Tell me it's a date if you want a date. Yeah. And then if you told me it was a date, I'd probably turn you down. <laughs> say, sorry. Yeah. At least give me the opportunity to say no. Like, let's set expectations here. <laughs> I would most certainly say no. Like, my obviously being aromantic and asexual is like, no. <laughs> it's like, no. Like, we can be friends. I'd be willing to go to a museum and go to a museum with you. Or we could go to a sporting event or something or, you know, spend time or go to trivia night. But not dating. Not dating. Not at all. Sorry. You know, we could hang out and be friends and be buds. And that's as far as I like my relationships to go. And if they had made Sheldon to be that way and just be like, I like just having friends and, you know, I just don't require, you know, romantic affection, that would be one thing. But they end up changing the script even further because they would throw in Amy into the equation. And this is where it starting to get problematic. So let's talk about Sheldon and Amy's uh, relationship. Amy Farrah Fowler, who is played by now Jeopardy host, Mayim Bialik. Mm, that is probably the only thing I know about the Big Bang Theory is that actress <laughs> and her career after the Big Bang Theory. And I can visualize what Sheldon looks like. Like I've seen screenshots, maybe little clips here and there. But other than that, the plot has been lost to me. Yeah. So I guess during season three, they started trying to get all the characters like paired off because like Leonard and Penny were in a state of will they, won't they? And then they end up starting the date. And and then Howard, because Leonard and Penny date, Howard gets set up by Leonard with Bernadette and they start dating. And Bernadette says, she's like really tiny and short. And she's like, you know, four foot eight. And, you know, she's and all that. And that's kind of her thing. And, and she's kind of a little bit, you know, she kind of is a little bit like, hmm. She doesn't kind of always understand like situations and social cues either. So she's in that way as well, which I guess fits with Howard because Howard's kind of like a little bit ghost himself. Howard lived with his mother and Howard lived with his mother till he was in his 30s and then met Bernadette and then they ended up getting married and had two kids together. And then Sheldon would end up getting paired up with Amy. But how they paired up Sheldon with Amy was really as problematic as it could get. And it's something that has almost happened to me, which is they put Sheldon on a dating website without his consent. Ah. They just kind of entered in his, you know, personal information and answered the questions as to whether, you know, how they think Sheldon would answer it. And they ended up drawing a match and it was one match and it turned out to be a girl named Amy Farrah Fowler, who is also a scientist. She is a uh, psychology PhD in psychology uh, where she studies on, she studies and does tests on like primates, like monkeys in labs. And she does, you know, test studies. So she's a clinical psychologist with a PhD 
and she's been an award-winning psychologist as well. So they ended up meeting and basically out of forced pressure of basically making Sheldon believe that he had a dirty sock somewhere in his bedroom, but they would not tell him where it's at. And it said, if you don't go on this date with her, we won't tell you where it's at and you'll just live with the torment of feeling like there's a dirty sock because Sheldon is very prone to cleanliness. So that's terrible. Sheldon ends up capitulating and going on the date. They end up meeting in a coffee shop and they meet a girl named Amy Farrah Fowler. And they do click very well. You know, they both share an aversion to soiled hosiery. (laughs) And uh, they do share an aversion to compulsive church attendance, uh, which uh, Amy only goes on dates once a year because her mother says she has to. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) So they both are under compulsory demands by parents that basically force them to do things. Sheldon is like, my mom says I have to do church at least once a year because his Sheldon's from Texas, East Texas. So it's, you know, mega church land. <laughs> it's like being for those who are unaware and are listening internationally. If you grow up in Oklahoma and Texas, you are programmed to literally live within like five minutes of a church, period. <laughs> I always say the joke, you can spit in one direction and it probably hit a church somewhere. That's about as equivalent as it gets. I've heard a person say it's like Jesus Disneyland. There are churches all over the place in Oklahoma. I imagine the Christians might take issue with you if you literally do spit on their church, though. <laughs> I'm not advocating for that, people, okay? (laughs) I'm not. I'm not. Of course not. Of course not. (laughs) Okay. So don't come for me, okay? Please don't, okay? Please don't. We're going to get angry emails. Well, I decided to spit in one direction (laughs) in Oklahoma, and I hit a church, and and now (laughs) now the Christians are after me. Yeah, okay. So please don't come for me, and please don't test that theory out, okay? (laughs) Do not. This comes with a do not try this at home label, okay? (laughs) So Sheldon and Amy click on that. And then the conversation they first initially have, which is at the end of season three, they end up having such great like rapport with each other that Sheldon asks her, would you like me to get you a beverage? Which is a huge step from Sheldon because like he normally does not do things like that. It's, so they agree to buy a beverage and Leonard and uh, Howard and Roger sitting there like, oh my gosh, what did we just do? And there's a hint going into the end of the season that this could turn into something more. And then by season four, the beginning of season four, Sheldon and Amy are an item and they're going to have their first official date after like, they didn't meet in person for like months. So they would like email each other for months. And then they finally agreed, let's go on a date in person. And they went on a date and then they kind of discussed things and Penny kind of brought up the idea of like, so what are you guys going to do when you guys go on a date? You guys don't even do anything. It goes, well, we've discussed the possibility of potentially having children if we do. It goes, and Penny kind of goes, are you kidding? Um, You don't like people touching you. How are you going to have sex? Sheldon kind of goes, I normally am informed of how people normally have sex and I don't want to do that. And, you know, Sheldon brought up the idea of we could just, if we wanted to have kids, we would just do an in vitro fertilization. And that way we can, you know, make a child that way without having to do anything, you know, of the coital relation. And that, you know, Penny was like, oh, you know, they make it seem like a something less of that. And I, I've often, <laughs> I used to joke, no, no, this is real true. I used to literally joke like that with my, my mom. And so my mom was like, when am I going to get grandchildren? It's like, you do realize, mom, I could just donate sperm and I could have a kid, right? Like, I don't have to, you know, I worry about you getting old and you're not going to have any children or anything. And I'm not going to have any grandchildren or anything. It's like, mom, if you, if I wanted to have kids or if I ever wanted to have kids, why, I wouldn't want to do it that way. <laughs> I, I literally joked when I was 17. I literally told like my friends, I wish I'd known I was ace when I was in high school because I used to tell my friends like they used to always talk about wanting kids and they looked at me so strange because one day I said, I never wanted to have kids. I've known I never wanted to have kids since I was 10. And I was like, uh, no kids for me. I'm sorry. I can't. I'm, I'm just not. And I told my friends like, I don't want to have kids. I don't want to have sex. And if I could, I would just literally get a vasectomy and end it, you know, and the possibility. My friends looked at me like, no, what is wrong with you? Like that is literally crazy. Like you must be, you must be out of your mind or something. And I'm like, no, I think I'm fully in it. I know who I am and I know what I want at the end of the day. Why does everyone seem to think that what I want from life 
is somehow lesser as a choice or is somehow like, you know, desensitized or robotic or inhuman compared to what you want. Just because I'm different and want different things does not mean I'm like cold or robotic. And they always frame Sheldon as somehow cold or robotic because he was literally throwing out the, if I wanted kids, I would just do the in vitro fertilization route. And we could just have a kid, you know, take some of my sperm and mix it with whatever eggs and we'll, boom, we have a kid. Wow. You know, interesting. We don't have to do anything coitally in that way. It's like, okay. You know, people saw that as like, that's really awful. And it's like, that is interesting because I feel like I don't know if there have been any like good modern representations of like IVF in media, but there there is a history of television shows treating in vitro fertilization as something that is gross and repulsive. Which is very, very weird because even my show of choice was The Golden Girls, which predated Big Bang Theory. But there was even an episode where, you know, Blanche, the hypersexual one, had a daughter who wanted to have a child, but she didn't have a partner. And she's like, I'm, I'm a modern woman. I can have a child on my own. So I'm going to get artificially inseminated. I'm going to do this, you know, IVF treatment. And... For a while, it's like Blanche is going to disown her child. She's like, this is terrible. I, I have no child who's going to do this. And she comes around enough to be supportive, but they still end the episode with the three golden girls being like, Ugh, it, it still gives me the, the ick. <laughs> and it's like, why? <laughs> yeah, it's just like you wanted a kid. So there you go. There's the process. There's a kid, right? It's just another option. <laughs> yeah. And obviously Sheldon, like Sheldon didn't want to seem interested in coitus at all. And Amy didn't actually particularly seem that way in the beginning either. Like she was really interested, like, like Sheldon and Amy were kind of agreed on, like they did, they wanted each other's personal space in a relationship. Like they, like you have your space. I have my space. You do your thing. I do my thing. We sometimes date and we'll come together. But then as the show went on, they really wanted to like intensify Sheldon and Amy's relationship. And it just was like, Amy got really, I guess, like they framed Amy as like the typical girlfriend route while Sheldon was like being the, you know, how do I frame it? Like Sheldon was being the aloof, distant boyfriend. Like Amy was like, I want to hang out and date and, and everything. And I feel, you know, really interested in you. And they signed a boyfriend, girlfriend, like agreement on documentation. And, you know, it took a while for Sheldon to sign it, but then Sheldon eventually agrees to sign it, albeit a little reluctantly. So they do end up becoming exclusively a dating item through that. But then as it gets onward and onward, like Amy gets really frustrated with the relationship. Like, I would love to have like a boyfriend that actually, you know, does things physically with me. And one episode in particular that really stood out to me was when the group was playing, was it Hunter the Reckoning? It's something like that. It was like Hunter the Reckoning. I think it was like something like that, you know, an RPG. And I we used to play role playing games all the time. And they were playing a relationship and the rest of the group, you know, Penny, Bernadette, Howard, uh, Leonard, and everybody tried to get Sheldon and Amy kind of romantically, you know, frisky. And they went into trying to hook each other up into doing it, basically. Like, they're going to, are they going to kiss now in the role playing game? So it went into an entirely different RPG, which is like, this is not in the RPG at all, for one. <laughs> so Sheldon kind of backs away because it's like, okay, this is getting a little too much for him. And it's just a lot of pressure for one, but he's like, I'm not really sure about this. And Amy's like, they see our relationship is like invalid because we're not kissing. We're not, you know, having sex or anything. And we've been dating for quite a while and we haven't done anything together romantically or sexually like that, I guess, you know, what people think of romantically, even though they're romantically in, you know, involved, they're dating each other. It's an exclusive relationship that is romantic, but they're not doing the quote unquote typical boyfriend, girlfriend thing that's supposed to follow this scripted timeline. Mm -hmm. And Amy kind of goes, they see her like, well, I don't, I really like you. And, you know, Sheldon goes, I've never even done anything like this in my entire life. So they kind of play a game individually on their own. And while there's no um, 
kissing or anything, it does show that the two of them have a really exclusive relationship where they can talk and be intimate and share each other's emotions freely without, you know, getting angry at each other, which I think, quite frankly, is a real big thing. They never really show that. They only like the show only focuses on like physical sexual affection, but it never really, you know, talks about the other forms of intimacy you can have with a person. They they devalue that throughout the show. Like in another episode, they end up having this faux prom because Amy never had a prom. Sheldon never had a prom. Most of the guys never had a prom. And while they're talking about prom nights, there's a discussion about like, are you ready to do anything with Amy tonight? Penny kind of hints at it. Are you ready to do anything? Because you know what happens on prom night, don't you? Mm. And like, what happens? Well, you know, prom night, it's usually like, you know, night, most people, you know, do the thing for the first time, right? You know, the thing being sex, obviously. <laughs> and Sheldon talks to Leonard and Leonard talks to him and was like, well, if you make sure before you do the first thing, first time, make sure you, you know, protect yourself. And he goes, then he told me that prom night is when, you know, people end up having sex on prom night. And he goes, and Sheldon goes, of course, you're not going to do that. You know, you don't have any feelings like that. And they kind of play it up like, okay, Sheldon, there's an obligation to, I guess, an obligation to, I guess, go forward with it. You know, basically bite the bullet, I guess, in a way, even though Sheldon does not want to have sex and has never shown an interest in doing it. Now it's like, you're going to have to, if you're going to, if you want to be in a relationship, you've got to do it. And I've often, something I've often heard growing up, which is why I didn't date when I was younger. Cause it's like, if you're going to be in a relationship, you, you, you just need to put out. Cause you know, that's an obligation for you. You know, that's what you have to do. That's what's expected of you. Like people always treated that, especially growing up in, in school. Like, you mean know, you never done, you never had sex before and you're in college. Like, what are you doing? Or you never had sex in high school. Like that's what everyone's supposed to do that's what you're supposed to do that's what everyone says it's like write a passage life you know i was like well it's not for me and it wasn't for sheldon but it was put on that pressure and eventually sheldon ends up having a panic attack because when he sees amy and and everything he panics and he ends up having to like lie down and everything and he's just so panicked and amy is frustrated because now sheldon won't even you know go near her because he's afraid that if he and amy get too close that amy will want to go further than what he's comfortable and what's comfortable with his boundaries i mean it's like it, it was almost like i would almost call it like the r word you know the r word basically was put on to sheldon like you gotta do this it was like you know forcing him into a box forcing him in a corner with no chance of escaping and it's like how come he can't just their relationship is just good as it is why do you need to do to pressure someone into doing things they don't want to do why do you have to put someone so much pressure on someone to forcefully obligate them to do that yeah that sounds so uncomfortable and might i say i hate the prom thing too because i did actually go to prom with a date uh, a boyfriend at the time and my only good memories of prom were dancing with my friends who were not my boyfriend <laughs> But I didn't actually like go home after prom because I was like, why would I go home after prom? So I, I stayed out all night and several people like family included took that as like, oh, well, you two had sex that night. And I was mortified. I was like, no, <laughs> just because I stayed out all night doesn't mean sex was what I was doing. <laughs> Yeah, like true story. My senior year, my parents were wondering if I was going to do prom. And I told them, why would I do that? I want to say that would cost like $500 to just get a tux and a limo. And I don't want to do that. My parents were like, you got to do prom. It's a once in a lifetime thing. It was weird because my family is like, don't have sex. Don't do all this. I grew up in purity culture and, you know, you got to abstain from sex and, and not do anything, you know, until you're married or whatever. Don't have sex. Don't have wet locks. Up, flee from from sexual sin and stay sexually pure and you know you know that all that you know true love waits stuff right purity rings and that's what i grew up in that's my culture but then like my senior year like why aren't you going to prom and i'm like because i don't want to and i don't want to and like i always make the joke with like my family i think i made this joke last time i was on like my family was like don't have sex don't have sex abstain from sex please don't and i'm like good i don't want to do it anyway and i'm like i don't want to do it at all and they, they didn't get the point of like i guess they were expecting that i would change at some point and end up wanting to but like I was being serious the entire time. Like I don't want to do this at all. Now it's like, wait, no, 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 please don't. You gotta. And it's like, you didn't want me to do it in the first place when I was growing up. Now you want me to make up your mind, make it make sense. 
Right. And so I actually didn't do prom. I literally spent like prom night. I think I played video games <laughs> that night. I played, I stayed at home and I played video games. And, uh, you know, that was actually a lot, probably a lot more fun. And it was, I was like, I saved money. I got to play video games. It was a good night. <laughs> I also skipped prom. Um, I worked at a Walmart my senior year of high school. And I remember management calling everyone who is, you know, 16, 17, 18 back one day as, as leading up to prom because they were like, we know a lot of you are going to be gone. We need to figure out scheduling. And I was immediately like, I got it. I can, I can work a shift. That sounds pretty good. Make extra money. Yeah. A, a few of my classmates came in to like buy disposable cameras. I was working in the electronics department. So I saw a few people come in in tuxes and dresses and whatnot. And they were like, what? You're working? Why? <laughs> what I want to know is why people were coming into Walmart. <laughs> I was like, I'm making money off of you. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. The Walmart was, it was right down the street from the high school. It was just very conveniently located. And they were what? Picking up Cheetos? <laughs> they were picking up disposable cameras. Oh, that's right. Because oh, they're taking photos. Oh, cameras. That makes more sense. I was like, what are you getting on prom night? Uh, yeah, so that, that makes more sense. But yeah, I mean, my prom, I mean, I know everyone thinks it as such a romantic thing. And I was there with a boyfriend, but... I mean, the most valuable experience I had at prom was having, like, my last dance with a friend of mine who, every time we'd go to school dances, we would uh, find each other and get together and we'd have a breakdance battle <laughs> because he was, like, the only other guy in school that breakdanced. And so we, we'd always do that, and that was, like, such a fun thing that we'd always have together, and it was just, like, such a cherished memory. And he was he was actually a year younger than me, so he was dating a senior at the time. And that's why he was allowed to come. We didn't do like junior prom or anything. It was supposed to be just for seniors and their dates. But he was there and I was like, I am so glad that you are dating a senior because we have to have our last dance. <laughs> And like, that was my most cherished memory from like the, the boyfriend was totally irrelevant, but it seemed like everything at the time, you know, cause everyone tells you that it's everything like that's the pinnacle of romance for a teenager, right? Yeah. I, I feel like I guess I'm a little envious of this younger generation because in a way, when they were, when I was growing up, I was growing up with like, she's all that and movies like that, that were like being prom queen and prom king was everything. And if you weren't, the prom king or prom queen you were like a loser like i literally just like watched uh, a month ago like because i kind of like drew barrymore as a talk show host so i remember when she did uh never been kissed which was uh she was playing the character josie geller i actually am writing like a little bit of an excerpt about like being the real josie geller because i'm like the real life one and she grew up she had never been kissed by anybody and she was when in high school, she was in high school in like the 80s and 90s, like late 80s. And you know her nickname was Josie Grossy. And she was being made fun of because she was like a you know geeky girl who was into, you know, literature. And she could tell you the etymology of the word pastoral, which is where I learned it. As you know, as a trivia geek myself, I find great affinity with people who love like etymologies and words and studying language and stuff like that. So I, I find great affinity with people like that. So she was a huge geeky girl and people made fun of her for that because she was a geek she liked poetry she liked literature she got a job at the chicago tribune being an editor because she loves literature and she graduated top of her class at northwestern so uh, everyone but everyone kept making her out to be a loser like you're telling me with all of these accomplishments she's done in her life graduating top of her class graduating college at the top of her class getting a job with one of the most respectable reputable newspapers in the country she's only a loser because she's never kissed any Anybody? Yeah. And so she goes back to high school. She has to live back high school, which is like, you got to become the, one of the popular in girls. And, you know, the in girls dress in a way, you know, short skirts and, you know, low cut blouses and stuff like that, which I never like getting on people for what they wear and stuff like that. But, you know, you got to be one of those in girls and a girl that's willing to do anything physically, you know, and she wasn't like that. And she was really cool. And it turned out she didn't need to do that to find the right person, I guess, because like at the end, the guy that she ends up really liking, liked her just as she was, even though that kind of it gets really complicated and messy. And they end up finally at the end having a kiss right on the middle of a baseball field in front of everybody because she tells everybody she hadn't been kissed. But they made her out to be a loser because she'd never kissed anybody. And it, it, again, that whole premise leads up to Sheldon 
where he hasn't done anything sexually and they make him out to be like the weird one of the group because he's never done anything sexually and physically. It's like, why is someone having to be like the weird person because they've never done anything sexually if they're not interested in that, you know? Yeah. I remember TLC. I don't know how many people remember TLC when they did this, but like TLC had like a television show when I was in college where they did this thing called, it was called The Virgin Diaries. And it was like, oh no, (laughs) I haven't heard of this one. (laughs) And they were doing like profiles of like people who were adult virgins and, you know, virgins into their adulthood and stuff like that. Because apparently you're supposed to lose your virgin by the time you turn one, I guess, before you turn 18, which is, are you sure you really want to put that out there as a, as a thing? I'm just saying. And, you know, there were people who had, hadn't had sex before and they were like, we need to study these people. We need to follow these people. Like, you know, it made them look like they were freaks at a carnival show, basically. Like, oh my gosh, look at how like, socially awkward this person is. One of them was like, it was so unbelievably cringe as a show, just cringeworthy all the way through. One episode, I think, had the couple getting married and they kissed on their wedding day. They saved their first kiss for the wedding. They ended up kissing and they were just, it was the most awkwardly looking kiss you probably could ever see. And I've never kissed anybody, so I am the least likely. So so you're you're not one to, to get pointers. <laughs> I'm not one to give advice pointers because I've never kissed anyone either. So I'm not looking at, I'm sure if I ever did, it'd probably be pretty awkward on my end. But yeah, and it made it look like, oh, this is so awful. And this is like terrible and everyone made fun of it and it went viral and everyone was talking about it. Oh no. And it's like, it was their first kiss on their wedding day. It was their most special day and y'all are making fun of them for this. Yeah, because the awkward kiss isn't the problem. The problem is that you're making it a spectacle for other people to laugh at. And it's their choice. Like, it's their choice. We always talk about people. You know, I wrote about this when I wrote about my article, when I talked about, you know, how even as an asexual person, I get still virgin shamed because like now 33. So I've officially, I guess that makes me the Jesus version because he died at 33. So I guess that means I, I really should test out my water. Tiger songbird is Jesus confirmed. And he's telling you to spit on churches. <laughs> Hey, that water might turn into wine. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But um, yeah, I might. I should test that theory out. Maybe see if I can actually literally walk on water now. So you know, like the basilisk lizard. Start with something pretty shallow. Don't like just run across the lake. We'll we'll fill up a kiddie pool for you when you come to visit us in the yard. <laughs> Yeah, so I'll have to test that out and see if that works now. And then maybe if I can do that, I'll turn water into wine or something. We could go into business and make a lot of money if I can do that. Yes, Ace Ace Wine. We'll dye it purple. Yeah, purple. Is there a purple brand of wine? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't drink. So see, see, that's the thing, though. They made it out to be where, like, I talked about where I was like being virgin Shane as well because of all of this, which I've been experiencing throughout almost all of my life. Because, like, people were trying. I grew up in a school in the culture or even in the Bible Belt. People didn't like to talk about sex, but everyone was doing it. Mm. Like, I literally had friends who were like teenage moms at like 16. So, like, people were really clearly doing it and stuff like that. You just got to do it and stuff like that. Like, not me. I just don't want to. I'm sorry. And it just was always my thing. And it's like, that's my choice. And I'm not saying my sexuality is a choice, but obviously, I don't want to. I'm like literally sex repulsed and I don't want to engage in sex at all. And I have no inclination of wanting to ever do that. And yet, Everyone makes it seem like you have to do that. And it's just really bizarre and strange to be made fun of for the choice like that. Like the Virgin Diaries did that. There was another one where a guy was like, his name was Skippy, I think. And I think he could find the videos, clips on YouTube of the show. And it's just really cringe. And he's like, he lives in his mom's basement. And and it's like all the, you know, horrible tropes of like being uh, that people consider a loser. Like, okay, people are now having to live with their parents longer because people can't afford to live (laughs) right now. You know, it's hard to find a house right in most places so and it's hard to find an employment job that's paying well to afford a house yeah well in any of these individual things that kind of become tropes for like a virgin loser quote 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 heavy quotes like any single one of these like they are not inherently bad things like living in your parents basement not a bad thing exhibiting autistic traits not a bad thing being autistic not a bad thing not wanting to engage in sexual activity, not bad, but for some reason, like 
uh, Hollywood and publishing and all of these stories that we're exposed to put them all together every single time as a big package deal. But not only that, they present it as a bad thing. They don't present it to, you know, humanize people that maybe do fit into all of these things simultaneously and say, hey, there's nothing wrong with them. They are they're wonderful. Like we we can hang with them. You know, instead, they're they're putting a Sheldon Cooper and it sounds like they're very much othering him like he is the nerd among nerds he's the geek among geeks he's he he's not even like it sounds like people are talking about him behind his back all the time being like oh we don't think he really has a deal like well have you had a conversation with it about him <laughs> like it's definitely a stereotype and what is with the mid to late 2000s repeating that stereotype because i just remember the movie 40 year old virgin with steve carell which was really popular that was 2005 ah uh, yeah i couldn't remember that movie it's been so long but i read like the first line of the plot and it's a shy 40 year old introvert who works at electronic store yeah and what's really bad about the movie like i when i watched the 40 year old version i think i was 15 or 16 so i, I remember when it came out and oh i literally had my head sink when i watched it because it's like oh my gosh they're making fun of like this person who's like really a rather interesting person just for the simple fact that he has never had sex i've also never seen that <laughs> If you have a Peacock subscription, like NBC Peacock, you could probably find it because I watched it just recently just to study up on that when I was reading, writing my other article that I'm about to publish. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is really terrible. This is really terrible because I'm making fun of people for not having sex at all, even though there's like that's like not even the biggest part of his personality. They could have highlighted the fact that he loves action figures and collects toys and he loves, you know, riding a bike, which is really, you know, healthy and environmentally friendly. And he works at a job and he ends up becoming a supervisor at the job. And they only highlight about, you know, well, the only thing that matters about him is that he has never had sex before. So that obviously means he must be some sort of weird loser, uh, weird reject. And they treat him like the the Dalit, the untouchables, the when I say lepers, I don't mean like people with leprosy, but like the way they used to castigate leprosy, like people would avoid and steer clear of the people because they were worried they would be contagious. Like, oh, my gosh, this is a really bad thing. I don't want to get near you. Horrible history. Avoid this person, you know, avoid this person shun them ostracize them from all of the rest of typical quote-unquote normal human society and they treated him like that meanwhile if you watch the 40 year old virgin he's the one with the least problems <laughs> in the entire thing paul rudd plays a guy who can't get over his ex-girlfriend leaving him and she's they've broken up for two years Oh, dear. Seth Rogen's character plays a dude <laughs> who literally had sex with a woman who was in a bathtub and was trying to have sex with like half of an entire room once and ends up and ends up one time even bragging about going to Tijuana to watch a really lurid thing. That I'm not going to go into further, but like he's got weird, really weird, super weird <laughs> problems of its own. And then his other friend, Jay, who is the one black person in the group, he can't stop cheating on his baby mama. And his baby mama keeps hunting him down and keeps wondering why he is going every day. And he ends up having issues with working on the job and they all work in a store. And the boss, who was played by Jane Lynch, who I love because she hosts The Weakest Link uh, now. Does she now? I didn't know that. Yes. The Weakest Link on NBC. So yeah, that's that's one of my favorites. I don't think I've seen that show since. Oh, you you have to watch it. Has it been around since the 90s or was it like early 2000s? I think I saw the original host. The original was Ann Robinson in the 2000s. And then you they are brought the weakest, the link. weakest link. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> yeah, it came on like right after uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire when it was still like Regis Philbin. Yeah. Oh, man, you're dating me. I love I love. <laughs> It's nostalgia about all my favorite game shows, but they're coming back. And uh, yeah, Jane Lynn posts a new Weakest Link, but she's in the show and she is just as a boss, she's kind of out there. It's like she literally talks one time about one time having sex with a gardener boy in Mexico and can't stop reminiscing about it. And out of all the people that he works with, Steve Carell's character, Andy Stitzer, is like the one that's the one that people should least be concerned with. And it's like he has a job. He rides his bike to work, so he stays healthy. He's in great shape. 
by doing that. He collects toys and action figures from vintage. And literally, when he meets Trish, Trish is a grandma now, and she's in her 40s. And to be honest with you, meeting him was the best thing that ever happened to her because she's got a young daughter, that's uh, which was shockingly played by Kat Dennings, who was on Two Broke Girls, which is pretty interesting. She's got a young daughter that's like all out there. And to be honest with you, before they met, they were in an in- instable relationship. He actually helped stabilize their relationship because one day he takes her to go to the um, the free clinic to talk about, you know, birth control and all that. And they end up having like a sit down conversation about like sex and all that with a you know certified sex educator. And it turns out he fi- she finds out he's a virgin. It's like, that was pretty cool that you actually stepped up to admit that. And I thank you for that because she was still a virgin at 17. So it actually made her feel like she wasn't the only one which actually kind of helped him not be able, helped her be able to say no to her current boyfriend who was trying to pressure her into, you know, doing it as well. So in a way, that was really interesting on that end. And then at the end, they end up getting married and the wedding is completely paid for because Andy collects toys. So he was able to sell just a couple of vintage action figures and they paid for a lavish wedding. Wow. He ends up becoming the boss of the electronic store. So you're telling me that this person who had never had sex before, yes, he needed to maybe grow out of his shell a little bit, but sex was not the thing that grew him out of his shell. He ended up just being a great person. He just needed to find his own person. They could have focused on that rather than everything else about not having sex, which is just like, oh, you missed it. Yeah, it's so interesting because uh, like whether or not there's an argument to be made about if that character is on an A spectrum, I think that's irrelevant. But when it comes to the ace rep and the ace coded characters, yeah, I always wonder why is everybody emphasizing the one thing that people in our community de-emphasize because regardless of where you are on the a spectrum whether you're like on my side and it sounds like your side as well where it's like repulsed don't like it don't need it or if you're in a gray or demi area where you know one's conditions are met you are all for it and can and do even enjoy sexual activity one thing that unites all of us is that we do de-emphasize sex we don't think it is the end-all be-all. We refuse the compulsory sexuality put on us by society in whatever way is our own. And so if we're de-emphasizing this thing and saying, hey, this is not important, essential to my humanity, why does everyone else go like, that's the thing that we're going to fixate on? That's the thing that's weird and wrong about you. Yeah, it's the compulsory sexuality feature where it's like treated as sex is the pinnacle or the hallmark of human experience. Like you have to have sex. And it's like, why is that? That's what, you know, gets at me, especially when we bring it back to Sheldon. That's what they make it out to me. But Sheldon and Amy's relationship out of all of the relationships probably has a lot of the same most normal parts of it because they're able to have like deep conversations about just things in general and yes Sheldon and Amy did break up at one point in the middle of the relationship they end up getting back together in the relationship because there just isn't you know they just still really care about each other in a way that never been done before for Sheldon he one time he ends up talking and he ends up you know missing Amy so much he even shows that he was going to propose to Amy at one point because he was just falling in love at that point. And it was like, okay, he's in love and it doesn't require sex. You could have focused on that part and that would have been even okay. Like you can have love without sex, but they still had to throw in the sexual equation, just like the Virgin Diaries did, just like the 40 year old Virgin did. Like these people in the Virgin Diaries, everyone made fun of them for being weird, but they could have just shown any person and they just had to focus on like the outliers of people that were like, what can get us the most television shock value? What can get us the most attention and make people like engage and watch? And we can make them, you know, look weird. And people like to look at weird and cringe like it's watching a train wreck happen. And they did that with like all the characters. Like, like there are so many other like virgins out there that exist. I'm sure I hope I would put myself in that boat are just like regular people that you just meet on the street and you can't tell who's who like virgin social construct thing. You can't tell who's in any way uh, because like 
the old script of who's a virgin and all that, like what counts for one or, you know, and the bleeding on the wedding night and stuff like that. You know, the old thing of take the old bed sheets and show if there was blood on them. And if she didn't bleed, it's not, she's not, she wasn't a virgin. It's like, well, and also just the like, uh, well, uh, what I will say traumatized me growing up, and I'm sure I'll talk about this more in the future, was the notion that gets into media that people can tell the day after you have sex. Like someone just walks into a room and everyone's like, oh, someone got lucky tonight. I can tell you're glowing. You have an aura about you that just exudes. I had sex recently. And that concept, I was like, no. Absolutely not. I can never have sex because if I'm going to walk into a room and people are going to be like, I know you had sex last night, that seems so creepy and wrong. And I don't want any part of that. Yeah, I think my glow comes because of the cocoa butter lotion that I use and apply. So <laughs> that, probably is, that probably is why I glow. So we take care of our skin around here. We are moisturized. <laughs> yeah, moisturization is important, especially with my conditions. So I have eczema, <laughs> so I really have to keep my skin moist uh, all the time. So interestingly, like they focused on that with Sheldon. And as the relationship grew on, that episode with the prom, because going back to that, they end up, Sheldon comes out of his panic attack and tells Amy exactly how he feels about her. Like, I really do like you. I think you're really pretty. I really do be with you, but I just, I'm not wanting to do that. And Amy's like, we don't have to do that. And I never wanted to do that. I never asked you to do that, you know, but I do want to have a boyfriend who will dance with me and will hold me when we dance. And they ended up going to prom that night and they danced and they had a good time. And that was a date and it was a special night for both of them. And it didn't require sex whatsoever. And they could have just made it about that. And it's just continually, continually, continually trying to push the ball down the field, trying to make it seem like we're going to try to get them to have sex as badly as we can possibly do it. And it's just like, okay, then it leads as time goes on to season nine. And season nine, Sheldon and Amy are back together and they are discussing. And the episode is the Star Wars episode. And Star Wars, the new Star Wars comes out and they're like, we're going to get tickets to Star Wars Rogue One. We're going to go watch it. And we're going to stay in this. You know, and you know how people were like lined up for blocks to just get an, uh, a ticket to go see the premiere. I had friends who went to the premiere, got tickets months in advance to go see Star Wars. And it's like, we're going to go watch it. And being a teacher, getting tickets <laughs> for an expensive deal, that's a lot. That's a lot. Uh, speaking of the whole living at your home thing, I'll go back into that. On a side note, there's a now new thing about teachers having to be provided affordable housing or apartments on school campuses now because teachers can't even afford to live in the districts they work in. And everybody knows teachers get paid jack squat in this nation. Pay yeah. teachers more. Yep, agreed. As a teacher, please pay teachers more. I was I quit teaching this year and I'm still looking for employment, but I quit teaching this year. And when I started teaching, I made like 40,000. With a master's degree, I made 41,000 bucks. With such a stressful and important job too. <laughs> That's wild. In my area, I couldn't afford to live on my one income on my own. There's just no way I wouldn't be able to. Um just another thing, but but back to the Star Wars episode. So on the same subsequent Star Wars premiere date, it's Amy's birthday, and Amy is Amy and Sheldon are back together, and and Sheldon and it's like, well, I I want to go see Star Wars. It's it's, it's Star Wars. Oh, I can't miss Star Wars. And Sheldon ends up having a dream where it's like, well, you can always go see Star Wars, but you only get so many birthdays with this girl. You got to go be with this girl. And, you know, he does agree to do the boyfriend thing. And I'm going to go out on a date with her and go out with her. Why don't they go on a date to Star Wars is what I want to know. Well, I guess she's not into it as much. Ah, uh, OK. But yeah, he spends his birthday with Amy and Sheldon comes up with the idea when he's talking with Penny and Bernadette about like, what would Amy like to do? And he said, I came up with a couple ideas. And then he says at the end, I say, well, I do have one idea, which is I'll have coitus with her. And everyone gets shocked. <laughs> is that how he says it? <laughs> And everyone gets shocked. I think Penny breaks a glass, breaks a wine glass because of, <laughs> of the shock. I was like, oh my gosh. Bernadette's like, okay, so we had this thing, this thing. And Bernadette says the wild thing. And then it's like, oh, uh, okay. But it's like, that's a huge step forward for you. That's a lot coming for your way. Are you sure you're ready for this? It goes, well, it's a lot for me, but I know she really wants to. So I'll do it for her. And uh, they end up, you know, Amy ends up, they end up telling Amy, it's like Sheldon wants, Sheldon said that he wants to, uh, you know, do the deed. 
for your birthday tonight. And Amy's just jumping for joy. You got it. He goes, you shut your mouth. <laughs> and they go, and they, they agree to do some of the preparation work. I'm not going to go into like all the preparation that they do. It involves a wax. I'll just say that. So they end up agreeing and the birthday is spent with them, you know, doing it. I guess considerably, both of them were losing their virginities to each other that night. It was kind of hilarious because like Sheldon's like, uh, I, I really need to get this down in writing that you fully agree and consent to this right now. So I'm going to go get a contract. <laughs> Let me print this contract out so I can uh, make sure that you fully consent to what's going to happen. Right. And so Amy's like, just don't. <laughs> and they end up and it was their first night. And his friend, meanwhile, Raj, Howard and Leonard go to watch Star Wars without him and in this movie theater, which is pretty interesting because they got Will Wheaton from Star Trek. So Will Wheaton showed up in his Star Trek suit and uh, the Star Trek and Star Wars beef was on in the movie theater. Uh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Live long. Suck it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, which was pretty awesome. So they end up watching the movie theater and they show the reactions of everybody after watching it. And then everyone's kind of sit back, like, you know, lay back. Like it was some sort of like moment of the greatest ecstasy ever. Like it was the best life changing. <laughs> One of those earth shattering experiences. You know, they ended up doing it, but it was like Amy was super nervous. Like, I've never done this before. Well, neither have I. I guess we'll learn together. And it was supposed to be like this really great moment. And, and it flash forward like hours later, it's like, wow, that was a lot more fun than I thought. And it was like hours later, and Amy's sitting there with her hair all unkempt and like, yeah, yeah. Just like it was something like they framed it as like sex was like this ultra amazing thing, like the best thing since sliced bread. It was like finally they had sex. It was so glorious. It was so wonderful. It was majestic. And which is so interesting because I feel like media always does that. Like, oh, I had sex the first time and it was wonderful. But I feel like everybody I know in person who has shared like their feelings about their first time has been like, yeah, the first time is bad. The first time is like bland and boring at best. It's like it's, people have de like allos have described it to me as like something you need to practice and know yourself and, and know your partner before things things actually like get good for whatever that means. And it's like, I don't think I see that in media where people are like the first time I was like, eh. <laughs> Yeah. And so often like pedestalized as like this, you know, ultimate world experience that like everyone has to partake in because it's like, otherwise you're not living life to the fullest. You're not like living and being an actualized human, you know, to quote like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you're like being a self-actualized person. And it's just one of those things, this continually gets built up. And then like, I remember in so many instances, like I remember an MTV one, there was another MTV one, like Virgin Stories, where they're like one couple was like losing their virginity to each other. And they didn't really describe it as too great. And I was like, okay, it wasn't that great. And it was kind of, you know, keeping it a little bit honest, but the rest of it was like, this is what wild, wild people do. This is what, you know, if you want to be wild and you want to be, you know, daring and audacious and bold and live a little and, you know, stuff like that, then you got to involve sexual trust and it's like okay here we go again what is so daring and bold and wild about it if it's something that's like i assume for like virgins first time that it's pretty vanilla and probably in the privacy of their own bedroom and i just want to know what's actually adventurous and wild about that <laughs> it seems very commonplace like ev everyone's doing it right that's what they're saying yeah every if everyone's <laughs> doing it you know if everybody's doing it you would think the countercultural thing would be to not do it that's non-conformist as, as it can get all of those those daring wild ace people out there that's what we are baby we daring we bold we audacious we're we're really just punks we're we're, we're just sex punks we're like yeah f the system <laughs> But not in that way. Fuck the system, but not in that way. Yeah. You know, just living my life is apparently a protest. <laughs> just being myself is a protest. That's really awesome. You know, that's really awesome when you've made it, when you just, my life is just a protest that way. I'm just living and being myself, you know, doing my asexual self and I'm just being me. And that's a protest. But it's just that sort of thing always gets framed in that way. And they framed it in that way. Like the relationship somehow became super official after that moment. Like they sealed the deal. Wow. They were already in an item. They were already 
uh, in relationship with each other. That didn't make or break that. That night didn't like seal the deal, make or break it. And I'm not saying that in a way like I know for some people, sex really does matter to them. And I'm not saying that like to diminish, you know, that for them, like, oh, you're wrong to think like sex is not a big deal to you or, you know, whatever. I'm not saying that, but it's like for people like me, like aces like me, it isn't, it isn't that big and healing to me. Like I, I would literally say I would do almost anything else. Like, how do I frame this? I don't like pizza rolls. I think they're gross. I literally gag at the sight of pizza rolls. Fascinating. Like I can't eat them. I can't even look at them. But I don't, you know, look at people who like eating pizza rolls or think they're like something like that and go, you're disgusting to me. I don't think lesser of them. It's just like, that's my preference. I don't like them. You, you good. Go ahead. That's not my thing. It's just like, you know, I typically, and this is going to come out a little weird. I typically eat salad with no salad dressing. I don't put any salad dressing on salad. I could just eat it plain. And the only less salad dressing I probably ever use would be like a raspberry vinaigrette. Mm. And that's all I can actually use. But everything else... Like for one, it's high in sodium for one and high in fat when it's ranch. But like, I don't particularly like eating that. Uh, and I particularly like eating it plain because it tastes better to me. But a lot of people look at that and will be like, that's really nasty. How could you possibly eat salads with no stressing? I don't eat sandwiches either. I don't particularly like sandwiches. I don't like mayonnaise, but some people like mustard. Some people like mayonnaise. And yet some people, no one, people from the mustard crowd shouldn't shame people who like mayonnaise. And people from the mayonnaise crowd shouldn't like shame people who like mustard. There's just difference. You know, we're just different. There's individual variants with that. What's your opinion on pizza bagels? The same. Sorry. Uh, okay, we we need to study this now, actually, because we we've got another ace who hates pizza bagels. <laughs> Another? Two Flower. Yes, there's a game developer who we we covered Arcade Spirits and we're we're actually going to have him on the podcast also. We've also sat down to speak to him, so that's coming soon if it hasn't already. I don't know when this episode's going out. But yeah, there there's this running joke where there's an advertisement and this, you know, robotic figure says like, "Did you know if you have pizza on a bagel, you can have pizza?" anytime and it's this big running gag with pizza bagels but the developer doesn't actually like pizza bagels and and that's like kind of the joke like i i actually don't like pizza bagels but everyone else seems to i actually particularly don't eat bagels in general so i no offense people like bagels and the bagels like i don't do the bagels especially with the cheese and and all of that like i'm not a big cheese person and it's just like yeah i'm just not interested so no pizza bagels if i wanted a pizza i'd just rather eat the pizza like a full pizza <laughs> so i'm going to say with my very very scientific uh studies and observations that aces are less likely to consume alcohol and less likely to consume pizza bagels Oh yeah. Uh that that's my assertion. <laughs> yeah, there actually is a study on that. Like aces are less likely to consume alcohol. You could throw me into that list. I am yeah. uh, to play each other. I have never drank like I when I mentioned I was never the wow you know, crazy teenager. All my friends were like trying to pressure me into drinking. So I have years of experience with like pressure and being pressured into things. So like all of my friends tried to get me to drink. They took me, like, they used to take me to bars and stuff like that when I was in college. Like, okay, well, let's see if you want to drink. And I was just like, just get me a water, please. Just water. Like, I don't want anything else. I go to bar trivia bars now and I don't drink. My friends drink. They're much more, you know, respectful now where they don't like try to force me to drink and all that, but they drink and I'm like, that's cool. You get your drinks. I'm just not going to. I've never been into drinking. I just don't do it. And I've never been into smoking, whether that's, you know, smoking marijuana or cigarettes or whatever. I've never smoked a day in my life. I've always been seen as like the weird one because it's like, you never smoked? You never done, you, have you, you never smoked marijuana? You never done weed before? You mean to tell me you've never done that before? How? You never drank before? How dare you not have vices? How dare you not drink? How have you not ever had alcohol? Like that's, you never done, dr never done drugs, never done drunk or anything like, and you don't have sex. So you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't have sex. Like what's wrong with you? And it's, you know, that same way it's always treated and framed in that capacity. And it's like with Sheldon, it's always seen in that capacity that finally he 
I guess, agrees, even if it's not something he's enthusiastic about doing. He just does it because Amy wants to, you know, just to make his partner happy. You know, finally, they feel feel like it's like making Sheldon seem like a normal person and seem like he's a rather, you know, like, oh, wow, finally, we can relate. And it's like, I actually was really upset at the show because I actually wanted Sheldon to not have sex because I thought it would have made the show like a lot better. It's like, oh, no, please don't make Sheldon try to convert Sheldon because Sheldon doesn't need to. This was going on around the time with like there were serial killers coming out with like virgin killers. I, I don't know if people never remember the story like Elliot Roger. Um, he was this incel from Santa Barbara and he was a Santa Barbara killer. And he was this incel guy who uh, described himself. He never as a kissless virgin. He never kissed and he never had sex. And he went on a killing spree because he was just so angry because people framed it in a way of like, oh, they called him the virgin killer because that was like the tagline with it. It was like, first of all, you're making it sound like there are serial killers turned into virgins and there were many more after him there was one in like oregon and another one somewhere else and the one in toronto was a serial killer and they were like all like incel like virgin serial killers and it's like you're making it sound like people who don't have sex turn into serial killers as if it's somehow their pathology to staying a virgin for so long when it's not yeah which we also have like dexter because we we talked about that show as well he was completely uninterested in sex and then they also decided to change that as they decided to give him more emotions and humanize him. So that's an issue. But the the incel thing, like, I see people say, like, aces don't exist, they're just incels, and that's such dangerous rhetoric. Because even a very recent shooting, I didn't see this get publicized widely in the mainstream news sites, but some independent journalists dug into sort of the internet activity of a recent mass shooter, and there was a lot of incel rhetoric there in talking about how, you know, men are kind of owed sex. And if they don't get sex, then women aren't owed protection and and just like vile things like that. Yeah. And the other thing about it is it puts pressure on people who are virgins or haven't had sex. And it makes them even more like it makes them feel even worse about themselves. Like you're making someone feel bad about themselves for no reason. Like whatever you're doing sexually doesn't tell about like the kind of person you are, what kind of human kindness you have what kind of, you know, generosity that person and has like that doesn't tell anything about that person obviously but it seems like you know that one thing people want to make it seem like you are somehow a like either insane or someone who is a potential murderer of some sort it's like hello someone who would do harm to others yeah yeah like someone to steer clear of it's like like that's a red flag like you have red flags on you it's like for what purpose this person hasn't done anything to deserve that like they haven't done anything to deserve being treated in any such way possible and by the way the whole serial killer thing the grim sleeper killed prostitutes he said he had sex with no one said anything about you know people who had sex being potential serial killers or ted bundy (laughs) and he was killing people or look at john wayne gacy he literally had sex with the corpses well they they also do like media paints the same nefarious picture for trans identities as well like going back to psycho is a really really um well-known example of you know, vilifying trans women because the representation in media doesn't show a genuine, authentic trans woman. It shows this uh, nefarious picture of of a, a crazed male who is confused and mentally ill and is going to inflict harm on others, which is it's wrong on so many accounts because also then you have the issue of people thinking that mental illness is inherently dangerous. And if someone does have some type of mental illness or some other type of disability or neurodivergence, it doesn't mean they're going to be a killer. It doesn't mean they're going to harm people. <laughs> And yet people will be like, oh, well, you know, watch out for the crazy people. And it, it's all just media needs to do better all around. <laughs> yeah. The other thing about it is with all of those killers, it was never their virginity that was the problem. It was never that because, I mean, it just isn't. It was all about they didn't want to talk about the reasonings behind the killings, like the incel MRA world that was, you know, talking about like picking up, pick up artistry and stuff like that. And these guys were turning killers because they were feeling like they were entitled to having sex with women. Like they should have been with me. You know, I'm a nice guy and they should be with me because I'm nice. And all these, they just choose all these horrible 
dirtbag men and stuff like that. And then they don't want to be with anyone else. And it's like, you often hear this all the time. And especially with the incel, you hear it with like asexual men, like people don't even believe asexual men because it like feeds it to the stereotype of like all men are just like, again, hate calling this out, but like dogs in heat, you know, they just want to just, all they want to do is just get, get sex. And you know, the old song, all I want to do is zoom, zoom and you boom, boom, you know, the old hip hop song, like, okay, that's all the guys think about, like the whole stereotype of men think about sex only like every six seconds, right? Well, not every guy is like that. And not every guy wants to be, you know, involved sexually. And then they made Sheldon basically have to fit into that. And then they basically yeah. took him from a guy who could have just been complete as a person being single and wanting to just be scientific. And then they had to make him into this. Well, we got to make him seem like, you know, character developed, like he's not developing. It was the same thing with Sherlock. Sherlock was, you know, a genius and he never had any relationship. He just didn't care about him. You know, he was, I, I, you know, David J. Bradley did a video and I'm completely agreeing with him that Sherlock is most certainly asexual. Oh yeah. He is, he is like one of the most famously sexless, like media characters in all of history. Yeah. When I wrote my first like mega tweet, cause I'm known for my mega tweets always. Um, when I wrote about that, the BBC creator of Sherlock, uh, Stephen Moffat said, well, we couldn't make Sherlock be asexual because what story would be would be there Ugh. if he were asexual? It's like there wouldn't be any tension in the story. It's like for crying out loud, dude. It's also so lazy. To me, it is such lazy character development to say this character's development that our entire plot is going to hinge around is doesn't have sex to now has sex. It's an activity. So if you're just saying this person didn't used to do this activity and now they do this activity, that is lazy. You're just assuming that everybody watching is going to impose a broader meaning, a more or significant meaning to the activity then is really inherently there or that they're more valuable as a person because they do have sex like oh well they're now a, like a real person or that it's really lazy writing because it's like do you really think that the only thing that really matters or that people can't have lies outside of sex in the bedroom yeah do you think people don't have people can live a full life without it and it's like there are so many other things people do besides having sex i'm sure even people who have sex don't have sex all day yeah well of course <laughs> I've heard have, I'm sure they have to do a lot of different activities throughout their day than just have sex. It's not like they just have sex 24 hours. Right. And what, what they're really doing is they're relying on their audience to assume that sex also inherently means something that is deeper than the activity itself, which in real life, sometimes it can be for people. It can be vulnerability. It can be, it can be showing trust to your partner. It can be showing these different things, but it isn't always. And we know it isn't always in real life too, because people have casual sex. People have one night stands. It doesn't mean you are a better person for doing it. So if you aren't showing it in other ways, then it's, to me, it's, it's lazy character development. It really is. Yeah. On that same end, it's like being an asexual guy. And I, I don't want to make it, you know, gender because I know there are hardly any asexual characters, period, in stories. So let's just get to the getting characters in. But like the difference between Todd and Sheldon, the years of growth since like it was 2018 when I think Todd came out as asexual, something like 2018, 2017. So some years had come between Sheldon and Todd. But like to show a full asexual guy who does not require sex, that is as much against the grain as most could possibly ever imagine. Because everybody tends to think like all men do this or men are dogs. You know, men can't help but cheat. And I was growing up in the era where politicians were having sexing scandals and cheating on their wives and stuff like that. And it's like, oh, men can't help it. And men just, all men think about is sex and stuff like that. It's like, no, we can make it so that, you know, there are people who don't feel that pressure. And especially as an asexual guy, I would have been over the moon to have an asexual character as a guy because it would have made it seem like, okay, I don't have to feel that pressure either. You know, for me growing up, it felt like I was under just immense pressure, not only being asexual, I'm also a guy. I'm also African-American. 
And the stereotypes of being a black guy just comes with, which I'm writing in my book, just comes with stereotypes of all black men just do is have sex and, and lay around and, and, you know, all that. And it's just like libertine and, you know, libertine people. That's what we are kind of seeing as like satyrs. And it's like having an asexual guy as a character would have been just amazing for me because it would have finally made it seem like, okay, you don't have to be like every other guy that they say you have to be. You, you don't have to be that stereotype. There are different ways and that there's, you could actually, you know, live and have a full existence as a guy and not feel the pressure to have to be that stereotype or be what that, what the media says you have to be. You can be what you want to be or what you feel authentically. And being an asexual guy is authentic to me. I could have been that and I'd still be within my own skin. I would have felt much more comfort within my own skin <laughs> as a teenager, as a young adult, all the way up in my mid twenties, trying to discover myself. I would have been much more comfortable in my skin much earlier when I was feeling quite frankly, many days, like I was going psycho. Well, and the thing is too, since you mentioned Todd, there were so many things that they did well. And I mean, I won't go into all of it because we did two episodes on how much we loved Todd. But the difference between a Todd and a Sheldon is that Todd had so much character development that was around finding himself, finding his sexuality, putting down healthy boundaries with a toxic friend, being a phenomenal friend to every single person in his life. There was literally an episode that was about like, Todd is the best person in the world because he does so many things for so many people. And the humor of Todd's asexuality, whenever it was used for humor, the humor wasn't on Todd as the weird one. The humor was on all of the sexual people in his life, making bad decisions, having unhealthy sex lives, not understanding something that was like, they almost played Todd occasionally as the straight man in those situations, which was funny because he was earlier the wacky comic relief. And I thought that was a beautiful subversion, but it sounds like from what you're describing with Sheldon that the, the comedy was supposed to come from, look at this really weird dude. Why isn't he more normal? Yeah, for one, Aaron Paul still gets fan mail and he says I, he was honored to represent the ace community in such a positive way. And I really thank him for that. I really do. Like if I met him, I probably would hug him <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, say thank you because finally that seeing him was such a huge moment just for asexual people everywhere, including me, most especially, I would say myself. But they, they also had in a news, like a, the writer's room, uh, Echo Gillette who is a an artist and illustrator and she's ace as well they had her in the newsroom kind of to help write the storylines for todd and she played todd's one of todd's girlfriends in the story to kind of help with todd and and it was really great that they like included ace people in their writer rooms Right. I actually don't know if Echo did any of the writing, but I do know that they actually reached out to an ace group that was local to them in Los Angeles. And there was a, a an asexual member of the community who was brought on to consult when they knew they wanted to make Todd asexual. That was the first thing they did um, from like season, what was it, three maybe? Yeah, three. Yeah, season three. And there, there's actually an interview with with, with that community member in the book, I Am Ace by Michelle Kirichunskaya. And that was really good to read because I, I had heard whispers like, yes, they did reach out to the ace community, but it was really nice to be able to put like a face and a name and like, this is the person that was actually helping to develop this character. I, I love that they did that. I think that more people need to do that if they're going to represent a group of people that they don't have firsthand experience experience with. Yeah. Big Mouth did the same thing. They had a consulting group they reached out, but it was just one episode. Same thing with Florence from Sex Education. That was one episode. And they reached out, I think, to an asexual like consulting group to try to get some of the story. But it was such a small snippet. So to have Todd be a full character with episodes and a long series and a long storyline and a character arc, that was really big. With Sheldon, it was just so poorly done. At the end, in the, to you know complete the story, Sheldon and Amy do get married, which is, it was done in a well done ceremony. And it was, they both ended up being together and they were together to the end of the show. And I think Sheldon and Amy both win a Nobel Prize at the end and, uh, and they go to Stockholm, Sweden to accept the award. 
And they, uh, Sheldon goes to thank all of his friends who are all in attendance and thanks them and shows that. But it, in a way that while they were framing it as Sheldon being like cold, distant, aloof, and then at the end he turn, you know, at the end he shows his, you know, warmth and you know loving side to all his friends and his kind, genuine, you know, kind, gentle nature, you know, to him. It still framed it in a way that made it seem like without Amy he wouldn't have been able to make it. And it's like maybe it's a little bit more aromantic, but the aromantic side of me, but it's just like Sheldon didn't need anybody to complete him. He wasn't looking. Right. He wasn't looking for someone yeah. to complete him. He was he was looking to just live his life and live it well and be happy in it. And it's like he wasn't looking for someone to but they framed it as like Amy humanized him. He com- she completed him. She rounded him. Uh, rounded out the rough edges, you know, smoothed out the rough edges of him. Yeah. And I don't like that, especially when there are so many traits of his that even though they said he was not autistic, it sounds like he was very autistic coded. And with, you know, the regimented eating and the scheduling and even the robotic nature, you know, there are some people on the autism spectrum that are that way, but that's not a flaw with them that is to be fixed. If someone is friends with someone who does doesn't sort of emote in the way you might expect them to. That's not a problem on them to learn how to emote better. That's a problem on you to learn how to still, you know, love and interact and interface with this person in a healthy way. And so it sounds like the character development needed to be on the other people, not him. Yeah. I always say like this, and when I was working with, uh, I don't like going back to this, but when I was working with my students with autism, when I was a para, and then I became a teacher, I always said it like this. They don't need to change. You need to change how you understand them. Yes. Okay. That's how I always said it. Because they don't need to change. They're fine. We just need to change how we understand them. We'll, we'll, I always live by the statement of phrases like life's like a paradise. So watch who you roll with. You learn and you grow with the people who you hang around with. And they could have made Sheldon and Amy just be friends and it would have been fine. Like, okay, you know, my friends, I grow with them, but they make it seem like the romantic relationship was the only thing that changed Sheldon. He could have changed due to his friends like Leonard Howard, Raj, Penny. They changed him a lot, you know, but they didn't frame it in that way. You know, they were significant in his life. I mean, they hung out for years together and that could have been seen as a significant relationship. The idea that the only significant relationship, because you know, I just literally just, my grandma died a few weeks ago, which, you know, sadly. You yeah, know. condolences. I didn't know that. Yeah. But going to the funeral, there were so many people who came to my grandma's funeral because she'd done so many like favors for people in her life. She used to be a caterer. She would cater like weddings where people wouldn't have much money. And I used to work her wedding. So she would cater these weddings and people were coming by to be like, I remember your grandma because she did our wedding. And I really thank you because we didn't have much money. Like literally she catered my brother and my sister-in-law's wedding and did it just pro bono, no money asked, just did it for the goodness of her heart because she was so happy for my brother. Aw, she sounds so sweet. Yeah. And that was, my brother was living at one point, living homeless at one point when before they, when they were dating and she just did out of pro bono goodness of her heart. Just let me take care of catering for the wedding and I will make the food. And my grandma made some amazing food, some of the best chicken wings you would ever eat. But I know if you're vegan, I know Courtney, you're vegan. So that's off the menu, but we did have a lot of other food. It was really good food. I I believe it. I believe it. (laughs) And she would make seven layer cakes and stuff like that. And she was really, really good at that. And the people that she impacted came by her life and saw her came back to see her on her funeral and we're back to say thank you. And people were treating that as somehow, you know, but the only thing that you say in a card is who is her significant other? Well, does that mean marriage? And that's the only thing people treat that as. It's like marriage. So they, the framing of the show was like, well, Sheldon was great, but he wasn't complete until he met Amy, my girlfriend who later could become his wife. And, you know, she completed him and he completed her. And it's like, you could be complete in so many other different ways. There are so many other relationships and it just diminishes the same that at that diminishes other relationships down to being nothing. Like, you know, if you want to get married, that's fine. I'm not saying don't get married. Like, oh, marriage is not all that important. I'm not saying that. But it's like to say that this other relationship is not as important. You know, I wrote about Thelma and Luis. That's one of my favorite all-time movies, Thelma and Luis with Susan Saranda and Gina Davis. If you haven't seen it, you got to see it. It's such a wonderful movie. And it really speaks to like the power of good girlfriends and 
even though, you know, they have significant boyfriends and husbands in their lives, the best relationship that the two Thelma and Luis have is with each other as friends. They literally rode to the death for each other because they care so much and love each other so much. I love that. And it's just like, why are you diminishing that relationship of a friend, of a best friend to being less than, you know, of a partner or mate? And it's just, uh it's one of those things with the mass of normativity that always gets weirded out. Cause like, even if I were to buy a house and I would try to buy a house, it would be just almost impossible because there's such a thing in housing world where if you're not in a marital relationship, people won't rent to you because like they don't think you're as reliable a renter. Uh, we talked about like the discrimination thing with asexual people face and like asexual people are the least humanized identity. Uh, even by other orientations, people see us as less human. Yeah. And that was by a survey of people. So that was the people being surveyed saying that. So that's not just conjecture. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Like, but on this, and another survey, like people who were like in housing relationships, like housing. People wouldn't rent someone if they were like asexual and then were like not in a couple relationship because I guess they don't think they're as reliable a renter or an owner or it's not like some people, some houses still have morality clauses. So like if you're living with your friend and that's like they see it as impropriety, the whole living in sin thing again. Yeah, there are there are laws in this country and I'm sure there are in others. I'm just not as familiar with them. But in, in the US, there are certain places in the US US that do have laws on the books that say, you know, you can't legally technically live with someone who isn't a family member of yours by other either blood or marriage or some other legal contract. And that's just really messed up when we allow the government to legislate what a family is. Yeah. And we saw this with people trying to, you know, the whole respect for marriage. As we, we, you guys talked about, I talked about with, you know, people saying that they don't want asexual marriages to exist uh, in their world because it's like somehow ruins marriage by allowing the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> it's a marriage inferno. <laughs> That's what one person quoted it as like people not having sex in marriage. That's like awful for some reason. I don't know. After we did that series, a very right wing Christian online literally contacted us and called us insults to humanity and nature. And I was like, I'm going to own that. I'm putting that in our Twitter bio. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess they'll call me that as well. then, yeah. <laughs> I uh, so I guess we'll all have to own that now. Is that that might have to be our group name if we have a group rock band? We'll just call it Insults to Humanity and Nature. I like it. Well, and the thing is too, because we've had a couple of I would say bad faith criticisms from some people in the community that as ace people we shouldn't be feeding into a matonormativity by marrying legally, which I think is a, a bad faith argument because there are a lot of reasons why someone in our current system would would feel compelled to get married. And that is such a personal decision for people. And we also criticize marriage as an institution all the time on our podcast. But it's also like we aren't playing ball. This isn't respectability politics where we think they'll accept us if we get married, because trust me, they don't. And we, we demonstrated that at length when we covered the Respect for Marriage Act and the outcry against it that specifically cited asexual marriages as a problem to be avoided. Yeah, I would say just to those people, it's like they're not looking for our ways we can be respectful to them or respectable to them. We shouldn't like we just need to be ourselves. And if they don't respect that, that's just not my mentality to try to gain your respect. I'm not trying to impress you. I'm going to be myself at the end of the day, whether you like it or not. But yeah, it, it, that, that whole thing of but back to the point of like marriage and friendship is like there could have been so many different ways the storyline could have gone. They didn't have to throw Amy in there. Amy's a great character. Um, I'm not knocking, you know, Maya Bialik at all as, a, you know, as Amy Farrah Fowler, but they didn't need Amy. They could have had other ways of like having Sheldon, you know, I guess mature throughout the years, evolve, you know, throughout the years. 
And it's just, you know, the idea that you only grow because you're in relationships or I grew up in churches where it's like, well, if you're not married and stuff like that by a certain age, you're just living as an extended adolescence or guys are just living like Peter Pan, just refusing to grow up. I'm like, hello, there are so many different ways of growing up. Are you saying the only time you ever grow up, you were just a kid until you got married? That, yes, that's what you're saying. Without it, without a marriage, you just be a child. That's what you're saying to people. You're saying that you have no, you had no ability to grow up, mature, evolve, change as an adult without somebody. Like the idea of it almost feeds it to, I wouldn't say in a bad way, but it almost seems like it's a codependency in a way. Like this is a code, like you're codependent. Like it almost feeds into that. Like I need you to help me grow up and stuff like that. Like, no, I, I think a better way of saying if you want a relationship, like I enjoy having you in my life. I'd like you to stay instead of saying, I need you because without you, I would still be a little kid inside. Like that's. Yeah. Well, people also use child as an insult in that way too. Like it is bad to be a child. Children are inherently worse than adults. And like children hear that children hear when other adults call each other a child as an You're insult. childish, childish. Yes. And, and that makes things so much more complicated because in our very sexualized society, there are are young kids, young teenagers who are adultified, who are heavily sexualized, and everything in this world is telling kids that they should lean into that and embrace it because it's bad to be a child. And if it means that having sex is what you need to do to not be a child anymore, that is not the message we should be sending as a society. Yeah, it's the whole sex makes you a man or sex makes you a woman or, you know, sex makes you a grown up, grow up, you know, be a man and stuff like that. You know, all toxic and masculinity statements, these sort of things make it seem like, well, if you haven't done so, then you're still like a kid inside. But I don't even get the idea. It's like, I don't even see where the, where the line comes from. Cause it's like, there are plenty of immature adults who are married, who end up, you know, being immature married people. And it's just like, really the idea is like, yeah, I'm, there are a lot of immature people who are married. Immaturity is not, is independent of your marital status. Status. I know people who are single who take care of their loved ones who are of elderly age and they have to do all of the taking care of the caretaking. Are they somehow still immature because they just haven't put a ring on a finger or haven't you know done anything with genitalia at that point? Please. Right. Or or people like like you and I who don't have kids but have taught children for years. <laughs> Like, I love kids, even if I don't have my own. Yeah, but even then, it frames it in the idea of, like, people being interested in certain things as being, like, either these are mature or more mature compared to this, you're into this, this is less mature. Like, the whole drinking thing. Like, if you drink, you're grown up. It's sophisticated. It's more cosmopolitan, urbane to drink. And it's like, no, it's not. You just, like, the taste of alcohol at the end of the day. I don't. Does it make you more sophisticated or urbane or cosmopolitan? Cosmopolitan doesn't make you more more well traveled than I am. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and to go back to because I I just had this thought about the Sheldon thing as well. The fact that he did decide to do coitus or however it was that he phrased it in that funny way. There are always people who do that, and I, I know there are some of our listeners who are like, well, you know, having sex doesn't mean you're not asexual, and that is true. That is 100% true. But the framing of it in a show like that is dangerous because he had other people in his life trying to sway him and pressure him toward that. And I'm sure watchers of the show who are virgins and or asexual themselves also have real people in their lives who have been been doing that either directly or indirectly or both. Racist his hand. Yes, yes. It, it's it's very relatable for a lot of us. We have experienced that in some way, shape, or form. But you have all these people pressuring you like, yes, this is something you should do, even if you say you don't want to, just do it anyway. And then they depict him doing it and being like, wow, that was so much better than I thought it would be, actually. <laughs> Then, then it's like you have now reconfirmed that the pressures by the other people were warranted and justified because.
because he just didn't know what he wanted. He just had to do it. And that is a dangerous framing. I think if there was going to be a representation of an ace person who does, for whatever reasons are their own, decide to have sex, whether it's for the benefit of a partner or for their own curiosity, that narrative needs to be driven from within that character. You need to see that character go through the steps of this might be a thing I want to consider and here is why and and having that as internal development rather than all these people are telling you to do it you do it and then go oh yeah actually pretty good though like that because that's also telling people who maybe say like I don't want to have sex that's planting yet another seed of doubt of is there something wrong with me is there something I'm missing do I just need to do this because is this going to be better than I thought? And that's not the message we want to send to anybody out there who either are asexual or maybe haven't found ace identity yet, but may one day find that it does fit them. Yeah. I was just literally thinking when we were saying that, it's like when conversion therapy came out in churches and they were often doing things like that, it was like, we just need to, you know, pressure them until they can be cured of their, you know, other gayness. And we got to put them in straight relations and make them feel like they got to you know, pressure them. And all it really did was we've seen time after time, the amount of psychological abuse come from conversion therapy and the amount of times, the higher likelihood of suicidality, the higher likelihood of substance abuse, the higher likelihood of depression and have had to you know, be subjected to conversion therapy. And it's like the show basically did that to Sheldon where they did a conversion therapy and tried to normalize it. Like it's okay because he wasn't, as he was asexual. So we just needed to convert him to being, you know, sexual because it's good for all of everyone. You know, he was, he didn't know what he was missing out on. You know, you don't know, you don't know what you're missing. Which is also very infantilizing, especially if it's someone who is like, a neurodivergent coded character too, because, you know, autistic or other neurodivergent people or anyone with disabilities are often infantilized and told like, well, you just don't know any better. Let us, the mature adults, teach you. Yeah. It's one of those things of, it's a paternalism. It's a paternalism. It's like, okay, you're basically treating me like a little kid, like I don't know anything in the world. And it's like, that's the wrong way to go at, after things. Like, no, I know enough about myself. Like you think you know me better than I know me. I think I know myself better than you will ever know me. And it's just like, you just got to go with what I am saying. And it's just that whole thing was in and of itself, just all around terrible, which was was why, uh, thankfully, we gotten past Sheldon as a sexual representation, because for a long time, that was the only one people thought of (laughs) as a sexual representation. Like, oh, you mean like Sheldon? I'm like, yeah, it was just such a big mainstream show. Yeah. So thankfully, we've gotten so much better and we still got a long ways to go. Oh, we still need more. We still need more more diversity within the ace rep that we currently have. And we just we just need more. But too too many writers do think that an ace character is boring or that there isn't character development to be there. And I'm like, uh, you must not know a lot of ace people because ace people are some of the most interesting people I've ever met. Ace people are some of my best friends. And we have so many stories that would be invaluable to tell. It, it also just to turn that back around on someone saying that to reflect on your skill as a writer, if you can literally only write something interesting, if it's a standard stereotypical romance plot like that means you're you're a one trick you've got one thing you can do Ooh, yeah. drag yeah. them yes voice with the point <laughs> voice for the win on that one all right i'll take that <laughs> i'll give him that one because that was really good yes yeah, so you know that's just i i guess to say we've talked so much about different representations but to talk sheldon was to talk all of them because there's just so much it was a micro sheldon was a microcosm of such problematic societal tropes stereotypes and mores that i just it was like he was a microcosm of all of it and it's just that these sort of things we still have to grow up from we're still having to fight this fight upward i guess to getting past that and it's just like Anytime we say it, it's almost seen like we get an article from the Washington Post that ends up becoming some sort of diatribe by some Christian nationalist about how, you know, they're trying to take away sex and outlaw and ban sex or something like that. I'm like, open your dumb eyes, please. Oh, yeah. There was like that New York Times op-ed that was like, have more sex, please. And we literally saw 
an op-ed to that op-ed that came out that was like, have more married sex, please. And we were like, oh, geez. (laughs) Yeah. And it's just like, you know, the idea of saying in one vein, like, oh, we're trying to outlaw man sex by being asexual. No one is even remotely doing that. But I don't don't even want to have the power to do that. If I had superpowers, I wouldn't even want that. I might want powers to control the weather like storm, but no, I would not want that superpower. Um, no. So it's just like, all we want is for people to realize you have a life that can be lived that's full and complete, regardless of if you're in a relationship or not, regardless if you're having sex or not, regardless of whether you even want to have sex or don't want to, in my case, being asexual, whether you're repulsed, favorable, whether you feel attraction or don't feel it, you don't need someone. It's just one of those things of like saying you're complete as you are because you are a person. You are you don't need someone to complete you. You don't need someone to masterfully make you a whole person. You are a whole person and the relationships you have will be valuable because of that. And I think you see it all the time. I mention this all the time when I talk about sex ed because I wrote an op-ed for LGBTQ Nation when I wrote about why LGBTQ sex ed needs Needs to be inclusive, especially for asexual people. It makes like the sex ed that we get in America is often so terrible. It's abstinence only so often. But learning comprehensively about things, consent, about different identities, learning about, you know, different things like romantic orientations in that, you know, you could be aromantic or you don't wish to have a relationship and to realize, hey, this is normal. There's nothing wrong with you. You're fine. You're great. That actually leads to less premarital early onset sex. Like they always say early onset. What they mean is like early onset. It's, it makes sex sound like a disease. <laughs> Yeah, what what they, I guess what they mean is like that. What they usually tend to mean is like before age eighteen or something like that, you know. And then less substance abuse, less STI transmission, all of these different things. It's positive for everyone to learn this. It's positive for everyone to feel and to know that they are a complete person with or without a romantic or marriage partner. Or if you just want to be friends with people, you're complete and you can be a loner if you wish to be. You know, it doesn't have, you're still complete. You just are different. And that's difference that, you know, we should celebrate, you know, the differences that make us, I think, make us great. As uh, Audrey Lord said, it's, like, it's not differences that divide us. It's failure to, it's failure to celebrate them. So we should just learn how to celebrate everybody and what they want and what their relationship needs are, and then go with it. And I think we'll see a lot better. Unfortunately, 2007 was not ready for that conversation. No, no, it was not. <laughs> I'd love to think 2020 we're finally there and at least ready to do it. Maybe. I'd like to think we're we're there. (laughs) I'd like to think we're there, but you know, we will wait and see. Some of us are there. Some of us in the community are definitely there. We're just waiting for mainstream society to catch up. Yep. It it often lags behind. It's sometimes the mainstream always falls behind what is, you know, going to be the trend. They always catch it late. Something becomes popular and it's already way, you know, months in. So it's just, I think our conversation is ahead of its time. I think we'll find in hopefully a couple of years, people will be like, I get what they mean. I get what they mean. <laughs> I understand. I was just like that. As I've always said, I think there are way more asexual people out there that don't know, but maybe we'll get to them and maybe we'll reach. So that's all I can say with Sheldon. That's the best I can give with Sheldon. It's not that Sheldon is the problem and I'm not mad at Jim Parsons or anyone. I'm. It's just the framing of the show that was the problem. It was the... And it was more reflecting of a microcosm of what society was at that time. And that was, you know, still problematic. And hopefully as we look backwards, just like I do with other television shows, looking back in time, we'll see it's better now. We'll see it was like, we're better for it. And we're better now than we were back then. <laughs> I like. Oh, think. yeah. Because that show would have also been if it ran for 12 seasons, it would have also been running during the period of time where that awful, awful episode of House was where House cured a sexuality and we we also did an episode about that previously because i watched that the day it premiered and let me tell you young ace courtney was not impressed (laughs) 
Yeah, I literally, yeah, I was thinking when I watched the show, I thought I was ace. And then my, I watched that show and my family was like, are you sure you haven't had your blood levels checked or anything like that? I've been, Do you have a brain tumor? <laughs> I had it all checked. Turned out I was just a okay. Yeah, I hated that episode. Hated that show. <laughs> I never could understand. And maybe this was just me and people are going to drag me in the comments or something like that, who are maybe big house MD fans. But I could never understand why that show got popular, or why people loved him so much as a characters like the guy is a certified jerk to everyone i mean he's kind of dr sherlock they used a lot of sherlock-esque tropes on him that are like uh, classically recognizable and widely beloved yeah and i understand like sherlock also had had that as well but it's like not only was it a certified jerk in a way to not only his boss and like workmates but he was also you know the substance abuse was crazy it was like he and Nurse Jackie, hey, they took so many pills. And I used to work at a care facility. They would have taken the entire care facility's worth of medication in a day. <laughs> Yikes. So, I mean, they were just, they were popping them. It was like they were popping them like Smarties. Smarties. Ah, oh, I've never liked Smarties. I never liked them either. I'm not a candy person either. We're just hating on all the foods and I know, drinks. It's like, and people are going to come today. like, <laughs> people are going to come by like, dang, don't y'all like anything? What Do you like anything? Yes. <laughs> I love being asexual. That's my that's my answer. <laughs> Perfectly put. Well, Tiger, please tell all the people before we wrap up today where they can find you, what you've been up to, what projects you've had since last we talked, all all the things. Well, oh my goodness. Well, after quitting my job and teaching, I've been writing. Uh, you can find me on my Substack, Tiger Songbird dot Substack uh, at Substack. So you can find me there. You can find me on Twitter, uh, handle Tiger Songbird. You can find me on Instagram at Tiger Songbird. You can find me on Reddit. I am the head moderator of our asexual the subreddit. There, we're actually going to you know getting ready for Pride Month there. So we're going to do some things on Reddit for uh, Pride Month for asexuality week for asexual month, uh, which is going to be really awesome. It's going to be really great. Uh, if you want to know more about that, hit me up on that as well. I'm um, doing some writing projects for different national publications. I have something for LGBTQ Nation soon. Uh, I continually write for them. I have something for Queer AF in London due very soon. And if you're looking for a writer, if you're looking for a writer to talk about LGBTQ IA plus rights and news and politics and topics, and you're just looking for a writer, or if you're just looking for a writer like me, or even an editor, and you're looking to hire, look to me. Hire him. I got you. I love, it's what I love to do. So um, I'm all out here. You can find me at Tiger Songbird, uh, T-Y-G-E-R-S-O-N-G-B-I-R-D. And I am everywhere. Um, so you'll probably find me and maybe even doing a couple of interviews, which will be pretty awesome. So just like I did today and just like we did with the Ace Couple, I really thank you guys. So please subscribe to the podcast. <laughs> please subscribe. If you haven't subscribed to the Ace Couple podcast, you need to do it. You gotta do it. It's going everywhere. It's becoming internationally known. <laughs> we are going places. That seems like such an exaggeration, but I guess it technically isn't. <laughs> We've charted in a number of countries, technically. <laughs> Actually, what are we up to now, Royce? Is it like 33? Have we charted in a, a country for every year that Tiger has been alive? <laughs> it's somewhere around there. <laughs> You're gonna have it's, to, it's in the 30s. At this point, you might have a Rolling Stone article. You're going to have to get ready to get your close up. Oh, I, I doubt it in Rolling Stone. And Rolling Stone has not uh, historically had the best relationship with the ace community. But I know. Well, we'll see. We'll see. But uh, yes, we will definitely thank you so much for, for that, Tiger. That was sweet. But we will definitely, for all you listeners, have all of Tiger's links in the show notes as per the usual. So you can find him on all the places. As he said, he is everywhere. Um, and we've also established that he is Jesus. So remember that Jesus is everywhere. <laughs> oh my God. I just float on air. Well, I just float on air. I don't even land. My feet can't even touch the ground. <laughs> <laughs> So on that note, thank you all so much for being here. I don't know if if some of the articles that Tiger has coming up have released before this episode comes out. We'll also have those in the show notes. But if not, be on the lookout for them 100%. And thank you all so much for being here. 
Oh, wait, 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 wait. We can't wrap up yet. I forgot a very important thing. I forgot. Rice, Rice, go get the thing. We have to, we have to do our verdict. Go, go get the thing. Where's the thing? Or tell me where the thing is. Verdict? Yes, Isn't verdict. Isn't it on the table? Is it on the table? Next where to is you? it? Hold on, hold on, hold on. S stand up. <laughs> it took me a minute to realize what she was asking for. <laughs> Oh, this is going to be awesome. I have a feeling it's going to be really awesome. You have a feeling you might be disappointed. <laughs> no, Royce! This, this is what the people have been waiting for, Royce. This is like the cliffhanger <laughs> of all cliffhangers right here. So, it is time to pass judgment on Sheldon Cooper. Is Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory good ace rep? I have acquired a gavel at long last. <laughs> We, the jury, in the recorded indictment, <laughs> find the defendant, Sheldon Cooper, bad. Bad face <laughs> rep. <laughs> dun, dun.